Hello, everyone. This is Hello. Clark, and this is Max Rempel, and welcome to Euphoria Chronicle Shockwave Radio. We are on Ascension Radio uh, the, with, through Impact Computing LLC. So we have a friend of mine that I've known for uh, quite some time. How long have we known each other, Max? I think since, um, it's about 11 years, since 2008, I think. Yeah. Yeah, so I've known you when you um, since you were living in Rochester, New York, and uh, now you're living in um, San Diego, correct? Yeah, San Diego, California. So I guess you don't shovel any more snow out there. Nope, no, the cl climate is pretty good here. Oh, right on. You go to the beach a lot? Yeah, that's yeah, that's my office. Right on. That's good. Okay, how's the water there? It's warmer now. Okay, that's good. So you swim a lot in the beach? I, this season is like late. It was colder, very unusual uh, long winter, but um, the um, rains helped the, the plants, so everything is green. Usually San Diego is like yellow, everything is burned out, but uh, now everything looks green pretty much like East Coast. Oh, good. Perfect. That's good. So how do the kids like San Diego? Uh, they, they miss the snow. They are nostalgic. Mm -hmm. Wow. Okay. I thought they would love the not shoveling snow and all that stuff. I think if they visit and like leave for a couple of weeks, they get tired. But right now they're like nostalgic. Nostalgic. Okay. That's mm -hmm. good. So, Max, let's give everybody a little bit of um, history on your background. Where, oh, where you do we start? Where yeah, I incarnated here. Born? Yep. Right. Um, yeah, I'm uh, a chemist by background, and I receive Russian jokes. Uh, like I'm from Russia, from Moscow, so I receive Russian uh, a set of Russian jokes every every day on Facebook. Okay. And one of them was, um, you know, it's about the food being chemically polluted. That a good chemist should should be able to make a bomb uh, out of a pack of dumplings. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, so I was trained as a chemist, and um, and then gradually I moved to DNA research, and then to like general bio bi biology research. And I always was interested in uh, metaphysics, and um, uh, I remember I was uh, 15 or 16 years old. I was walking on the street and uh, looking at the stars, and I made a conscious choice. I said. How about I will be from Pleiades? I looked at the sky, and uh, in Russian, um, it's called stajare, means um, lots of fires, many fires. And um, I decided that I, I will be from there. So it was a conscious choice. And um, I think it was a decent choice. Good. So are you from the Pleiades? I, I have a good connection. I love Pleiadians, yeah. Good. And they say I'm from them, but you know, uh, I, when they said it first time, I wasn't I wasn't sure. I thought they just uh, want to recruit me. Well, I'm recruiting you right <laughs> now, right? Yeah, well, um, I volunteer to visit. Our, our producer of the show is a uh, Plejaren, as he likes to be called, right? Okay. Um, I thought the Plejaren name was only reserved for. Billy Meyer, who claims to be the only one that sees UFOs, which he's dead wrong, right? Because there's many people that see these UFOs, including myself. However, I like Billy Meyer still, but he's not the only one. And um, but the proper name, how they like to be called, is Plejaren, right? Um, so Billy Meyer was right there, right? Um, Audrey Ewis, of course. Uh, spent some time in the Palladian planets, Era, Lyra, right? And um, well, he's the producer of the show, and he's been doing many things. He's set up uh, Impact Computing LLC, which uses a lot of um, hemp products. Um, basically, he's doing everything hemp. He's, he's 3D printing a lot of uh, things with uh, hemp. Uh, he wants to... Um, take the world away from oil and into a hemp industry, right? For everything, right? Including wiring and um, fuel and um, 
utensils, cups, right? Anything and everything, basically. He says can be made out of hemp. But it's pretty cool that um, where our topic today is hybrids. Uh, Audrey Eos is actually um, a star being. Um, so he's a little bit, he's a real thing. He's the real deal. He's not a hybrid. However, the two of you should connect, right? Okay. Um, he's, like I said, he's in Oakland for now. Um, might be a few weeks or a couple months. I think it might be a couple months, to be honest with you. But uh, you should make contact with him, get in the car, tell the wife I'm going to be gone for the weekend, and visit him. It's going to be worth your while, right? A good idea, yeah. So um, I also wanted to visit uh, Richard Allen Miller. Uh, he is in Oregon, so that that I might stop on the way. Okay, all right. So um, when I met you, it was through the Rochester UFO group. Uh huh. And, um, we were with the aliens and outer U U UFOs and uh, Euphoria, or back then it was called Euphopia. And then Euphoria Chronicles, Euphoria started up. And mm -hmm. um, Max was the first person to ever interview, interview me, by the way. Um, it was a series of interviews that he did. He recorded me. And uh, that's out on the web. And I also interviewed one of his first lectures, too, that he did in Toronto. And, um, and now here we are 11 years later, or 10 or, tw or, 10 or 9 years later. Um, and we're sharing our knowledge together. Uh, Max, what have you learned since the nine years or eight years since we met? Right. Um, yeah, that's a <laughs> loaded question. I think um, my initial research was correct. So uh, that that was the biggest um, the biggest learning. Um, so when we met, I already was doing the research. And the starting point was 2009, February 2009. I just uh, finished reading the book uh, by Lynn McTaggart. It's called The Field. I have several copies on, on the shelf I give to friends. And that's a great book. And it talks about science. Basically, these are interviews with scientists. Um, considering the idea that um, quantum laws of the physics should be expanded to the macro beings as uh, humans and bigger entities and bigger uh, subjects and objects. So, um, and it's sort of mind-blowing. The, the, the main scientific experiment which blew my mind at the time was that um, you can um, do um, inter... Uh, it's called diffraction and um, interference. You can do two slit experiment in physics with uh, small, tiny crystals of the size of the hundred atoms, and they're pretty, pretty well organized. And even those multi, multi atom crystals, they, they uh, go through two doors at the same time, so they obey the quantum physics laws. And from that, you can extrapolate that everything is obeying quantum physics, and everything is a wave and uh, everything um, can tunnel and everything can um, uh, is subjected to this uh, spooky action at the distance by, by Einstein. So the whole idea about telepathy and um, astral projection, all of that is covered by, astro, uh, by quantum physics. So, so for me, it was a big um, eye-opening idea because until that moment, there was a world of metaphysics, which I was interested in, and there was a world of uh, science or material life, and they were not connected. But, but at that moment, they, they connected. It was a big reunion of two worlds. And, and when I closed the book, maybe a few minutes after, it was my birthday, a few minutes after, I thought, hmm, if that is right, that was like a, a nice leap. If quantum laws apply to us, then I should check out the aliens on, on internet. <laughs> because until that moment, I remember like I, I arrived to America and I was, my English was kind of poor and I didn't follow the politics. So uh, we were sitting at the um, 
scientific lab lunch and um, our co-workers were talking about some aliens and I said it was Cuban aliens actually but I was I said um, I don't believe in aliens because I didn't understand the point um, uh, but actually I didn't believe in those aliens which look like humans and are funny with big eyes and uh, I was thinking that if aliens exist there, they should be so different. They would be like cockroaches or octopuses or something like that. But you know, why would they be human, right? And that was like the weirdest coincidence from you know from that point of view. But then I started researching. As as soon as I started researching, there was instant recognition. I recognized the greys. There were pictures, real pictures of the greys, real videos of the greys on YouTube in two thousand nine. And it was, uh, I know you guys. And uh, that knowing was pretty sickening. I, I became sick. And I was uh, investigating like crazy for maybe for three weeks, just diving in and like nonstop. Um, crop circles and stuff. That, and, that tends to happen, the diving in. Yep. And um, it was lots of recognition, lots of understanding. I know that, I know that, I know these guys. And there was lots of fear because I don't know, the, some history, some negative history with them or something. Um, and then and then I became sick. I was sick for half a year. I was like, yeah, like limping, going to work, but like uh, there were pains in the body. I felt sick. And after half a year, I finally got used to that idea. So it was a transformational period. How old were you? Oh, gosh. I was born in 64, and it was 2009. You have to do the math. Okay. All right. All right. Around 40 somewhere. Anyway, um, I'm now 55, I, I believe. The, the reason why I ask, um, in 2007, and in 2007, I was 40. So mm -hmm. September onward, I went through a really big transformation myself. Um, I, I, my eyes were going bad. I had constant headaches. I had the ringing cedars in the ears, right, or tinnitus, right, going off all the time. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, I was um, right into UFOs. I joined the UFO group, and I was seeing um, from September 29th till um, December 15th, I seen over 100 UFO sightings, all at the same time that this was going on, um, uh, to cope, right? So I was doing a lot of things. I was self-medicating as well. Uh, I was meeting a lot of interesting people. Uh, at the same time, we were doing channeling, lots of channeling, right? Because uh, I met a channeler. And, um, and then you yourself was two years later where you had your big transformation. Now, you said you, um, you didn't believe oh, in me. I checked. I did the math. It was, I was 45. It was exactly. I was 45 years old. That was my birthday. Okay. Go, go ahead. So you said you didn't believe in aliens to your co-workers and then something changed your mind. What was it? Um, I didn't believe that the aliens would be humans. I was thinking that aliens would be anything but humans. Just because, because you know, if life evolves in every planet independently, then why would they be humans, right? They would evolve into something else according to their planet. That was my, you know... Yeah, and, and the book by McTaggart, the understanding that the whole world is an illusion, kind of, if that is an illusion, if there is a, a conspiracy around quantum understanding of the world, then I thought maybe the aliens are, I don't know, it was a quantum leap. I, I, I cannot explain the logic, but from quantum idea to, to aliens, there was like one logical boom. I don't know, maybe it was telepathic influence. They said, you know, check us out, and I went to check, check them out. Um, my other, uh, another awakening was in 1999, and at that time I was um, doing my science, and um, I had lots of, um, how do you say, uh, resources at my disposal. I was a postdoc, but uh, at uh, National Cancer Institute in Bethesda, Maryland, Washington, D.C., uh, there was, um, you know, it's, it's, it's like a, an isolated paradise. And uh, you can do a lot of science if, if you are motivated. And I was motivated and I did like free flowing, free research into the depth of um, genetics of behavior. 
<clears throat> and when I looked at my data, I realized that things don't don't match. Basically, the the materialistic concept of um, genes defining behavior didn't uh, wasn't quite sufficient. So I realized that possibly uh, there, uh, that's a place for metaphysics. There is something in, in the genes which is not understood by science. And I was at that time I I was I think I was already aware of um, uh, energy medicine. I was aware of energy medicine. At that time, it was pretty distant. It was sort of a concept rather than practical knowledge. But I knew things are happening. I knew, I knew there was intuition. There is uh, energy influence. I can sense energy. So I was thinking, how do I combine my idea of sensing energies with a chemical view on the DNA? And I realized that there should be a wave component, resonance component in DNA. So that was my, I guess at that moment it was just a, a hunch. I didn't have the literature. Oh, no, no, there was literature. I visited Moscow and after a break, after five years of being absent, I think, maybe three years of being absent. And a friend, I didn't speak to her much. She was just like a, a co-worker from the neighboring lab. She brought me a book just out of nowhere, brought me a book, gave me a book and said, check it out, you might like it. You know, th things like that happen, like you never com communicate with that person before or after. She was just a messenger, brought you a book and said, check it out. So that book was an awakening into the holographic nature of the biology and holographic nature of the DNA. Uh, the book was by Garyaev, it was called Wave Genome. And I still have it on my shelf, and it started on me on, on that direction of research, and I'm continuing till now. And finally, I'm making a lot of progress. Finally, after 20 years, I'm making a lot of progress in, in that direction. Okay, cool. So um, the, the question I ask everybody that comes on Euphoria Chronicles is, have you ever seen a UFO? All right. Uh, I'm jealous to those who've seen. I, I, I watch them on YouTube and uh, sort out the ones which are computer-generated fake and the ones which look like real ones. I go to C5, which is a Close Encounters 5 group, uh, Stephen Greer's type. So we come there. And um, ni nice place, by the way. In the, in the desert here, uh, just one hour drive from San Diego. The sky is really nice, clear. It's uh, almost always very clear sky, and you can see so many stars. Like normally, you see like a few stars in the sky because of the light pollution, because of the fog. But in the desert, the whole light is like shining with little tiny st uh, stars, and uh, wow! And the Milky Way is like really saturated, so you cannot see individual stars. You can see that they come together, and it's just a cloud of stars. You wow. think it is a cloud, but when you look more carefully, it's you know individual stars. So, so you see lots more, and there you meditate and um, in a group. And some people are talented. Some people somehow make it happen that uh, things appear in the sky. Yes. Uh, when I do it by myself, it doesn't happen. When I meditate with them, it does. So it's something they do. Um, the best we saw, there was like a, a feeling of energy coming. So that, that was very real. It made me sick, actually. And then uh, they were flashing uh, like these powerful green lasers into the sky. I have those now. Okay. One of these now. And um, they flashed back. So they flashed, flashed, flashed and then we, they started flashing back from the certain area of the sky. And we all saw that flashes back. And it lasted for about half an hour. And I counted 21 instances when... All several people in the group said, you see that? Yep. And I saw that too, because I was silent, but when they say, you see that? I saw that. So for me, it was a pretty nice confirmation simul when we simultaneously saw the flashes. Okay. That was my best, unfortunately, that was my best UFO sighting. Okay, that's but, good. But um, I will mention one more when we go a little down uh, the road on channeling, because that's, that's another story. Okay, that's fine. Um, about the sky watches, um, the best stuff 
we had a lot of people like we take on sky watches too we've stopped doing sky watches just because they're so busy in the weather and everything else and and stuff like that and i put a lot of time and energy into it and uh, i can't do it all the time right but anyway when we did do them they were fantastic especially uh, a couple people in the group that had night vision goggles and at one point um a buddy of mine named birdman i'm uh, just going to use his name birdman um he had some high-end uh u.s military goggles i think they cost ten thousand dollars he had the money he bought it and he bought it to a couple sky watches at one point we had about six or seven people that never seen a ufo before and um it was a dark night we seen stars not as many as you described in the desert but we seen a few and with the night vision goggles we seen a lot more and uh wow we had we gave a bunch of people some of their very first ufo sightings and uh, it was awesome it was amazing now those ufo sightings they're not uh, close encounters of the first kind because i believe they have to be within 500 feet uh, close encounter of the first kind however they are what we call minor ufo settings and your ufo settings nonetheless and from there uh you might be able to see more also when you're in tune with them and what that means being in tune is it's very easy it's um all you gotta be is you gotta basically have no fear uh if you have anybody in the group that's fearing them then it's going to distract um, the end goal accomplishment. So if everybody's in a good mood and vibe, um, chances of you seeing UFOs are greatly increased. Also, make it benevolent ETs, right? You want to have benevolent ETs because you don't want to have anything bad happen afterwards because there are yin and yang. There's good and bad. So... Um, and it, the how you do it is you think it and will it it's and then it becomes telepathy they hear it right even though you're not physically doing telepathy to your knowledge you really are because when you're thinking it and you're picturing it that's telepathy and it's just a, a matter of um uh, matter of uh training and then you'll have the telepathy happen right now that's the best advice I can give when people are sky watching. All right. So, are you still there, Max? Uh, we got a broadcast board, uh, uh, Ascension Radio joined us. Yes, I noticed that. I think that's Audrey Ewis. I think. Audrey Ewis, are you there? Audrey Ewis. Silent. Silent. So okay, that's okay. We'll keep on talking. He'll join when he can. Okay. So, um, yeah, so basically, you were talking a few minutes ago about channeling, right? So I know right. you've done a lot of channeling um, since, since we basically haven't seen each other. You've been in the channeling. Um, tell us about that. Well, let's do... Uh Chronologically, so 2009, I um, started researching the aliens. And for me, the biggest um, challenge was to combine my scientific worldview with, um, with the aliens. And in biology, we know for sure there is evolution. We can watch it, we can observe it, we can see it in um, Darwin's eyes, basically looking at different fossils and plants, we can see evolution. And we can look at on, on DNA side of evolution, right? So we know that we are from Earth, we evolved here, right? And at the same time, the, there are common aliens who are most likely much more ancient because they have better technology. And they look human and they come from the universe, from elsewhere. How do you solve that problem? Like we have one origin here and somehow they, they are very similar to us, maybe they can even mate with us, but they're from elsewhere. Did they evolve there by some uh, strange law that they like all life evolves to humans? You know, that's one, one option. We get a chat here. All right. So, um, so that is, was problem very hard to solve. 
and it is solved by the idea that uh, we evolved here, but we were helped. And at some point there were seedings here and the seedings of different light forms continued and we evolved. Uh, so there is a seeding and then there is evolution. There is another intervention and there is evolution from that point. So we evolved here, but there were interventions on the way. And there is crosstalks. So for example, uh, some alien races when their planets are destroyed or where it is like, um, wars going on or they have to run away for their lives they take refuge on earth and they start their colonies and some jump, some of them just come to um uh to help us and it's a nice playground so so there are many reasons for them in the past ancient aliens to come here and to do genetic engineering so there was continuous exchange so there were histories that pleiadians and pleiades they actually were here for some time and then they moved to Pleiades. Some of them, like uh, they, like the movement was from um, Orion to Pleiades and from Orion to Earth to Pleiades. So that explains that paradox. So, so that kind of a problem I had and um, I was researching everything and Bash at that point Bashar, the um, uh, alien channel by Daryl Anka, he was most helpful because his, uh, his channels were most informative in that direction especially about the hybrids and and the evolution so i listened to all of the bashar i could find at that point and based on that i sort of built a picture and prepared my talk which was september 2009 i presented at ufology um il interest group in, 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 in rochester new york and then that, that became a book and i wrote a book about all that stuff I published, self-published it. What's it's the name called, of the book? Uh, celestial Science. I was talking about science, but the science from there, so I call it Celestial Science. And it's available on Amazon. Um, and uh, so it's, I think I published, it took me three years to actually write it and publish. So I published it in uh, November 2012, um, just before we expected a big change. And... The, the, the change was subtle, it was a big disappointment. Um, and then, um, but the, the change happened. And then 2013, I met a channeler. Uh, actually, I met a few channelers before that, but it was um, occasional. Um, but then I met a channeler who is channeling for me since then every, every, every week. What's, what's so, the channeler's name? Uh, James Charles. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. James Charles from Rochester, New York. Oh, he's, he's from Rochester. Yes, he's, he's from Rochester. Oh, okay. And, if I was and I think he is giving the webinar in Canada, right? No, not webinar, seminar. Uh, maybe it was this weekend he went to Canada, some north of Toronto, and gave uh, a workshop. Ah. So he was like there a couple of days ago in your place. Um, so he is a great channel, one of the best channels from my perspective, because I need some scientific answers and he is really good in channeling specific scientific answers. And he's like channels lots of beings. By now I think it would be maybe hundreds, a few hundreds. Wow. Yeah, so we invite beings and they come. So does he also astral travel? No. He's just channeling. Just I think he's, you know, when you channel so much, there are things happening. So he's, there was a lot of spiritual change happening. So it's called the Sephiroth. It's called the ether, right? So when you get in that mode, it opens up a lot of doors, right? Mm -hmm. And um, things are open or more susceptible to happening. Mm -hmm. right? Um also with channeling too there's a lot of tricksters out there right, right so right. you can have like a demon come in and say oh i'm i'm um i'm casper the friendly ghost uh-huh but he's not casper the friendly ghost right uh-huh right and he, and he can manipulate people and do a lot of things right right um, so that's that's like that's a little warning about channeling right 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 yeah don't do it at home 
I'd be very careful. Yeah. Right. Yeah, no, we do we do uh we do teach channeling classes and most of that is what to not to do and how to approach it and how to live with it. Because once you start doing things of that sort, the whole life changes. Lots of people went through a life crisis after they got that you wanted that talent, right? You want the talent of talking to the aliens, but then the talent comes with the life change, with the change of the life path. Like lots of people, they were married, they had to separate. And so lots of couples were broken because one of them starts channeling and the second doesn't want that change. And uh, the weirdest thing is that um, uh, we got the new higher selves. So Jim started channeling and after a few years, he pro progressed to a certain level. So he got a new basically set of spiritual powers, I guess, and skills so he built up his spiritual muscle and he was given a new higher self so the the new higher self basically is a new person who is advising you and guiding you and the old one is still connected to you but they kind of step on the second place and same thing happened to me i got my new higher self and i actually like him very much i like the old one too actually so i like both um that's a guide, but, a spiritual guide. Um, it's even more than guide. It's uh, it's it's more like a self. It's more like self because you get you are plugged in. You merge. It's like a complete reunion. You unite right. with them. You become you become them. They become you. It's uh, two drops merge together, become one drop. It's it's complete merger. They still they still have their personality, but there is a lot of change which happen, which people see how's and your family life right now good question right good question uh th there was um it, it happened in steps and um, basically my wife had to learn to live with a new person <laughs> okay the reason why i ask it's uh, yeah in ufology itself um from alex collier to many people out there um including me like we have our things like i'm still with my wife don't get me wrong but um we fight we argue and we go through different mindsets um however i'm still faithful and stuff like that and but it's hard it's very hard and there's a lot of people in ufology that um have split with partners and um are going through changes and stuff like that so in the ufology community as a whole, it's not uncommon to see that, right? So right. I think yeah, and Jim changed too after uh, his higher self came. He changed too. He became smarter, stronger, and um, he got the talent and building community. So lots of things changed. Right. We have Audrey joining. Oh. Audrey, are you there? Is Audrey there? I heard a little ding dong there. Is there Audrey there? Hello. No. hello. Yes. Oh, there he is. So Audrey Lewis, meet Max Rempel. Max Rempel, meet Audrey Lewis. It's nice hey, to Audrey. Meet you, Max. Nice to meet you. Hala la 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 You guys are live. We're live. We're on the radio right now. You're on the radio. Well, hello world. Hello world. So this is Max Rempel. From San Diego, California. The topic is hybrids. And we were talking about channeling. We we're talking about the Sephiroth. We we're talking about um, UFO sightings, UFO sky watches. I've known Max since 2009 uh, when he was living in Rochester, New York. And um, at that point, Toronto's UFO groups and Rochester's UFO groups were kind of like sister and brother, and we used to do things together. And it's not like that now, but it, it, I don't know, it's kind of in the air. Everybody went their own way. But Max, Max actually moved to San Diego, and uh, he's doing his thing there. He's an accomplished author. Uh, Max, what was the name of your book, Celestial Science? I think you're muted, Max. Okay, the first one was Celestial Science. I published several books, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, why don't you name them for everybody right now? Oh, sure. Um, so, 
Uh, celestial science is the first one. Second one, uh, you can find it on Amazon. Uh, the second one is um, uh, Welcome to Earth. And the story of that book was interesting. I, uh, I met the aliens who didn't know much about us and had very, very, very strange ideas on how things are happening. So I decided to write the book for them. And actually, it looks like it's more popular out there than here. It was basically explaining to the aliens why we are so screwed up and what needs to be done to help us. So that was um, a very exciting project. I wrote it as a series of letters. I said, you know, you aliens are so um, advanced. How about you? I set up a, an email box for you and you just check it. And I was sending the letters to this email box. And meanwhile, I was um, talking to them through a channeler, and there was a, a conversation going on. And I was trying to learn more how, what they know and what they don't know. And, um, and there, basically, it's, it's also autobiographic. I, 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 um, I lived through uh, Perestroika, which is basically Russian a falling apart of Soviet Union and transformation of Russia from the old style to the new style. And um, and still, uh, I think maybe about 1986-88, we were isolated, pretending that, you know, Americans are like 100% evil, that is the whole world behind the Iron Curtain is evil, and uh, information flow from outside was like, close to zero. And that resembles very much what we have now on Earth. The Earth has iron curtain against you know, all galactic community. And information that gets into the media is uh, so distorted. I mean, it, it gets here, but it's so distorted. Um, so, and, and then there was, um, we were behind the iron curtain, but most of the time we were on the radio listening not speaking right like we do now. We were listening to the Radio Liberty from Prague, funded by CIA, uh, I think it was funded by CIA, but funded by by the Congress anyway, um, and and some other uh, Russian speaking stations from outside, which were broadcasting inside, and the sound quality was terrible. It was like always the sound. Uh, so Russian. Uh, stations on the border were like like skype is today <laughs> yeah like like uh, yeah like some of the, those uh they were broadcasting the noise as soon as there is something interesting on, on the radio they would broadcast the noise so you would be uh get used to listen to that noise all the time like it was like especially at night when nobody is uh, watching you you would listen to those it's called tampering tampering okay so, uh, and then by, by bits and pieces you get from the radio, you reconstruct the, what was the life outside. And then, uh, and then the system started falling apart and then there was a transformation. So I lived through that awakening in Russia. And it was a great model to what I think is happening or will happen uh, when the, um, it, it's called disclosure, when the disclosure happens when finally the earth somehow realizes that the community, the humans, the humankind will realize that there are aliens and the aliens are not so evil in, 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 the, in the mass, then, um, then there will be a huge transformation of the society. Yeah, but and, Max, Max, I got to interrupt you. I got to interject. This mm -hmm. is the thing I don't like and I don't get and I don't think it's fair with all the people that are involved in the disclosure movement. I don't mean all the people, because I think Alfred Weber's not like this. Um, and I, Stephen Bassett, he's kind of cool too. But um, they all say, well, you know, it's, it's when Washington gives disclosure. You know, Peru gave disclosure. Argentina gave disclosure. And Mexico, UFOs are on the 6 o'clock news all the time, all right? Um, it's all of South America, there's full disclosure there. And yeah, Spanish culture is great on that, yep. Right, so, it, you, you know, this disclosure movement, it's, it's only North America. And it's like, you know, you got to accept the people in the disclosure movement in Toronto, especially, right, especially, all right, you got to 
basically accept the rest of the world, which the planet you live on has already been disclosed. There's nothing else to disclose, right? It's there. They have videos. They have contactees. They have accounts. But then they don't want to, the accounts of the contactees. It's like a, it's like a business almost. Like, you know, come to my conference and we're going to disclose. Like, disclose what? Like, what are you going to tell me that I don't already know, right? That's why a lot of times I don't go to UFO conferences because what is there for me to gain? You know what I mean? There's, there's what? I'm going to listen to the same story like over and over and again? Come on, right? So anyway, I, I, that's my rant. It's a well-needed rant because there's a lot of people in the disclosure movement they don't give the credit to contactees where credit is due. And, and what's underneath their noses, they can't even sniff it out, right? They, they call themselves uh, researchers, detectives, paranormal researchers, everything. When we have real-life um, Star Brothers walking around, they walk right by them. Walk right by them in a conference, and they, they're just like, you know, oh, buy my book. Oh, yes, yes, you know. I'm going to do my next lecture in Houston. I'm going to do my next lecture here. And meanwhile, like five aliens are just looking at them, like, okay. Right? Observing, walking by, right? It's so right, right. I'm aware. Uh -huh. Right? Um, anyway, that was my rant. That's a yeah. rant. Yeah, so that, just to give the parallel, um, you know, in Russia in 1983, like three years before it started, we were meeting in a forest, sort of half secret, but if you wanted to join, you could, through the network of friends, you can come and you would discuss the, the truth by the fire and by the campfire. You would discuss the truth. You would discuss the, how real things happen. And so there was a community, like a grassroots community, which knew everything. That's what you described. There sure. are grassroots communities, but the the collective awakening of Russia didn't happen. I mean, the news were completely controlled at that time. And they were controlled until, um, I would say, 1988. So another five, six years, there was like, I was, we were some years ahead. And there were some people who were like 30 years ahead. They were like, were dissidents, right? So there is that uh, layers of society which basically don't, so some get it and some don't, right? And some people, they even can get it if they are in your group. They kind of come come with you. They understand it. They sort of dive in. They absorb that information. But when they get back to work, they forget about it. Because the mainstream uh, mindset is so strict. If They have to, like, basically split their personality. One part of the personality knows about aliens, believes in aliens, likes them. And other parts of personalities, they know. At work, at um, uh, mainstream parties, you should shut up and not think about that. And that disconnect happens ju just fine. So, so we live through the same same type of... And in Russia, that was like real, like that split of personality was real visible. Some people are so censored. Uh, there was a whole generation who knew what not to, what not to talk about. They really knew that stuff really well. And um, even when transformation happened, prehistorical happened, they were still afraid to speak about it because they remembered that in the past it was, it was like a death death sentence, right? So that uh, schizophrenia uh, split between layers of society and individuals is is happening right now. But people are awakening. And people finally flip from being afraid to not being afraid, from uh, yeah, from being mind, mind wash to actually awaken him. So that's my uh, second book was about that, that transformation. And uh, I suggested you guys really don't understand us in many ways because I spoke to them. I understood what they don't understand because for them, they look, they're aliens. They are higher dimensional. They are from, you know, they call themselves four dimension in our conversation, but you know, some people call it fifth dimension, but basically it's one level up in the dimensional space. It is a different world. They can see us. We cannot see them. And when they see us, they see us through their technology. They can shift down below using technology, basically, dialing the dials and transforming themselves to visit here. 
temporarily, but biologically they are from a different dimensional world. So this layer of creation is more uh, interested. The main drama there is creating new civilizations, uh, how the civilizations interact with each other. So it's basically Star Trek, galactic, galactic politics. That's exopolitics. That's their main drama. That's their most interested. So the Greys, the Yael, the many others, they are like founders, seeders, they take care, they they are farmers, they are farming us basically. So for them, the ecology and the global global and galactic ideas are, are important, but understanding what happens down here below in our individual lives, our families, individual lives, and how we are all separated, for them it's unthinkable. They cannot comprehend how we can be so broken. Individuals, lonely individuals separated from each other, and even within itself you are separated, parts of you are separated. At the same time, you believe in aliens and you don't believe in aliens. You can function in a material way and also you can pray and, and do energetic world in a spiritual way. So uniting these parts is, uh, is uh, what we are doing. But, but the book was about, the, about us to them. So, and the third book was uh, a few years later after I did lots of channeling, conversa channeled conversations to them, with them, I still asked lots of questions, understood our history, understood how the dimensional world works and um, how angels are in the world, all, all of that stuff. And that, that's basically, I wrote a textbook. The idea of it was, uh, you know, these hybrid kids, they are, they come here, they don't need convincing. They are from out there, they are basically uh, already the believers. They just need information to, they suck in the information. They don't need, my first book was full of references. And I have to like, after each statement, I would say, because of that, because of that, like we believe with certain certainty or certain uncertainty, we believe that and that. So. That was the style of uh, trying to prove to non-believers what I know, like scientific, sort of scientific style, uh, logical scientific style. And the third book was the other way around. Why do I need to prove that to, anyone, to anyone anything? There are kids who just want the answers. They will believe me if, it, if it's written right, they will believe me without any references. So I wrote it as I know it, Actually, it was a couple of years ago, as I knew that two years ago, just a textbook on metaphysics and how the world is on all levels, on reincarnation, on uh, energy healing, on aliens, the history of our civilization, how we fit in the galactic history. All of that is, um, you know, the chapters in the book and how to live with that. And uh, it also comes from our... Um, we have a community and we do workshops. So we talk to people and we do webinars. So we, we teach people how to, how to do things, right? And there are two types of people. Some of them are old, old style people who need to connect to the higher dimensions, like grounded people, which started from material world and then they evolved to understand the higher dimensions. But also there are crystal people indigo people, hybrid people who come from the other worlds, incarnate here, and they don't need to learn how to connect to the higher energies. They need to learn how to live down below. Big they need time. to uh, learn how to how to survive in that here dense yeah. environment. Yeah, down yeah, below on here. Earth. On Earth, yes. Yeah. The, so, the worst place on the universe. Right. It's true. Like, I mean, you're talking about indigo. Like, I've had so many problems uh, growing up, right? Um, well, I shouldn't say problem. I, I would say situations. Situations would be better, right? And adjusting, right? Adjustments, right? And, um, and then it led to me doing a lot of things um, to adjust to these situations and adjustments, right? Uh, life is hard. And we didn't even know indigo until Dolores Cannon invented the word, right, indigo, right? And then I said to myself, uh-huh, so that's why I did that. Oh, wow, so that's why I like purple. 
oh, wow, that's the reason why I did that, right? And you're exactly right. Um, indigo people, crystal children, crystal kids. Actually, crystal kids aren't really kids now. They're coming of age, right? They're in their 20s now. Yep, 20s, yep. Early 20, you know, 25, up to the 25 range, right? And, um, you know, a lot of them have, like, special gifts, too, and stuff like that, which brings us to hybrids. Now, do you know any hybrids? Um, I am a hybrid. <laughs> okay. Right. Um, yeah, there are different types of hybrids. Um, essentially, the whole planet is hy hybrid. Uh, well, are, are you a human with spiritual traits of another planet that makes you a hybrid? Or are you born a hybrid? Uh, good question. So, um, all, all humans here, except maybe Australian Aborigines, all humans are have lots of alien seedings. Uh, and the question is, how recent was the hybridization? How many of your genes were uh, seeded like very recently in historical times and how many were seeded like long time ago? Because seedings continued fro for, from the very beginnings. They took uh, some primates from Earth and they hybridized, 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 hybridized. Some hybridizations were um, were by the aliens to create the vessels, the vessels for themselves. So they come here as uh, higher dimensional beings. They can survive on the planet for a certain period, but 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 they want to to continue to reincarnate, and they need vessels which would be good enough for them to live in. So that was one of the reasons. Another reason, you know, some, the That's grays the and the It's the spiritual type. Yeah. yeah. And the grays and the yell, I mean, that's their sense of their mission. Their mission is seeding the, the races. Lirans came here as founders in the very beginning and, in the solar system. And um, uh, they were just refugees. Their planet was destroyed and they were refugees and they seeded here. So, that continued, and uh, Anunnaki were uh, playing with the uh, genetic engineering to create a uh, better uh, stratified society. And bingo, bingo, hybrid. Right. That's what in the physical, in the 3D on Earth, when you cross breed, okay? Mm -hmm. So it's like, for instance, I'm white, white, white. Um, white, but I got like kind of a bronze uh, complexion with a good tan. And then I mate with a black, all right? So I mate with a black and we have mulatto. Okay, I'm not being racist here. I'm just speaking the truth here. Or um, I mate with a Chinese, right? And I get the China eye, right? Like the China eye, right? Whatever, right? right. Uh, you get different characteristical traits. So Anunnaki was human. Nephilim and something else, I think. And then you got um, you got the Anunnaki. Audrey Hughes um, can explain it a lot better. But there's other hybrids here. They have hybrids in, um, of course, in U.S. bases. They have hybrids in area in the bases. Uh, all the bases. Uh, I I know one, right? Actually, I know two, right? And, and next week's guest is um, is a hybrid. Right, and she's um, she's gonna give an amazing talk, right? So, um, do you know any hybrids on that level? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, I like Pleiadian hybrids. Um, I like Pleiadian hybrids. I just feel good uh, synergy with them. But um, so basically, some of the hybrids are very recent. Um, some of them are just the product of love, like uh, an alien comes here and uh, he decides to stay here and have um, a family with a, a harem, with a mate. A harem. Not necessarily. You know, <laughs> some just uh, just uh, fall in love and decide to... Abjol. Yeah. And they, they produce a hybrid. Uh, but there is also uh, colonies of hybrids which are in a space. And... Uh, and that's a different story. They are, many of them are made not to live on Earth, but basically to export Earth genes out there. 
and to uh, start new races out there to s um, populate new planets and stars and create new races. So um, I hear that um, some of the Yael, um, Yael are hybrids between Yael and, uh, and, and humans and, and they, they just start new civilizations like that. As, and uh, Esasani is one of those. And uh, you know, one of the reasons the Greys were doing the hybridization with, with the humans is to fix their uh, genetic distortions. And um, as a result, they produce new civilizations. So hybridization out there happens. And until uh, uh, some time ago, it was mostly secret against the will of people. Uh, some people who asked to volunteer for that, but most people just, you know, wouldn't even ask. The Greys initially, they didn't ask. They just stole people, stole the uh, egg cells or would implant. Yeah, that was a typical procedure. Would They would impregnate the woman. Um, yeah, they would produce embryos uh, and impregnate the woman and then steal the fetus when it's big enough. And, and then um, they would bring them, would, would incubate the fetuses out there in their, in their incubators. But then when humans uh, hatch and um, grow, they would still need some of the earth energy. So they would bring mothers to feed the babies and to give that um, healing energy because the hybrids, at, at least in early stages, they wouldn't survive if they, if they weren't handled by human mothers. So, so there are reports like that, and um, yeah, I interviewed some of their uh, abductees and volunteers who worked on those programs. Um, what I started, what um, when I started speaking to the aliens, it it happened in 2013 um, around May, so it's five, six years, six years ago. Um, Jim just started channeling, and um, he he started channeling in my presence because. I wrote a book, I was aware, and the aliens wanted to speak. So they used him as a psychic to, to speak to me. And the first thing I spoke to said to them, I apply for a visit because I know there is a lot of bureaucracy there. And, uh, you know, to get out there, you need to. to I to, did that to, too. Yep. But go on. All right. And, um, and then I was I created a plan that I, I was tired of the planet. It was... Um, I wanted to go, so I wanted to be out there and explore the galaxy and uh, and actually help the Earth from outside. That was my idea, but um, I couldn't leave my family. So I said, "How about?" And and my family couldn't leave the Earth either because you know the kids was, you know, they needed com community. I didn't want to completely emigrate. I wanted to bring some some friends with me and. Uh, that's what happened, again, it was from my experience of, on Russian transformation. In Russia, this radio station that broadcasted through the border all these years of the Iron Curtain, uh, the people who spoke that were the immigrants from Russia who escaped and broadcasted back. They knew Russia because they knew Russia. They were passionate about helping Russia to awaken and because we didn't trust the people with accent, you know, those alien, those, um, okay, those foreigners who learn Russian abroad, they were speaking with accent, you can't trust them. Oh. But they were, when our people were speaking to us, we trusted them. You knew the and, language, yes. And we knew what they're thinking because we, you cannot fake it. Right. Especially when, when they were talking and there were uh, tears in their eyes. You can, you can hear that. So uh, my idea was, how about we do the same? We go out there and we'll broadcast back to Earth. And uh, I know there are some programs like um, which work with Earth and they hire some of the Earth people to do the work from outside back. So they sort of, they base there and then once in a while they land here, do their operations, speak to the governments, do a lot of work here and come back out, out there to, to live there. Uh, so I suggest, how about uh, we do more of that, and you take me and take my friends, and I will tell, uh, I will take uh, uh, people like like Jim and uh, and James Borg, and um, and we will uh, we'll create a colony there, and we'll 
mingle with you, we'll teach what we know about humans, and together we will do the, we'll help the awakening. And uh, they took part of that idea. They created the colony, but they created it more like to study us rather than to, to interfere. Uh, it's uh, the alliance which volunteered for that, basically st stepped forward. It's called Girk Fitnir. Girk Fitnir. G I R K F I T N E E R. Girk Fitnir. And um, we are good friends with them. We know people there, like through channelings. Uh, and um, then I needed people to volunteer to basically to go. And uh, I created an email that still works, like a, a mailbox on Gmail it's called Sign Up to Go. And I believe it's still being checked by the aliens. And uh, if you want to tell them anything, you can just simply send a message to Sign Up to Go. Obviously, I cannot guarantee that uh, humans wouldn't read it. And I'm sure the Secret Services, you know, somebody is like checking it once in a while. <clears throat> but anyway, the aliens would read it too. Uh, so, and I basically advertised the idea online. And um, we created a community called Human Colony. And to create a unique uh, hashtag, I abbreviated to HUCOLA. First letters, Human Colony, H-U from Human, C-O-L-O -O from Colony HUCOLA. So that's a nice hashtag. So you can go to hukola.com or search hukola on, on YouTube. And um, we, we started immediately, we started like a few weeks later, maybe a few months later. Our first broadcast was on YouTube, um, October 2013, 13th of October. Six years, almost six years. <clears throat> okay. So, um, so uh, the community is still alive. And it started with the belief that it will take us. I mean, that was a great excitement, but I couldn't guarantee. I mean, it wasn't the first time that people got excited that it will be taken. It was, I guess, the second time. Um, and the first time it just was a blip. There was nothing happening. They didn't take it. And the second time it's almost like that, but they didn't promise a day. They didn't promise to specific humans that they will take. But after people sent email to sign up to go, they got a visitation, basically an interview at night. And people like, um, more like a, an astral projection would come and they would have a nice conversation and, and some people wouldn't realize it was an interview. But basically, they, will, uh, they uh, interviewed us, some of us, not me. And, um, and then people would have um, astral projection dream as they visit the colony and meet each other. So some people see me there, some people see some hybrid kids. So <laughs> that was a very nice confirmation because people would just report that, you know, this night I was astral traveling. Uh, physically, there was very little happening, but on the first, uh, first night, after the first time I spoke to the aliens, I said, I'm flying to for a visit. And I said, we need to, uh, to do, to do a, chemi a, a biochemical test on you to make sure you're compatible. I said, yes, I give you my um, uh, permission. Next morning, I woke up with wonderful... Yeah, uh, it's like two, 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 like big mosquito or bee bites in a geometric pattern angled, so seven bites. And I have still a photograph of that. And it stayed for half a year. So this, you know, bee bites go away in, in a week. But Were this pattern. Uh, Georg Fitnir, they're mostly yeah, yellow. But yes, they have Pleiadians among them. There, there was a Pleiadian in the first. Seven. Seven, yeah. seven stars, right? Seven oh, could planets, be, could right? be, uh huh, could be. No, there is. I mean, there is many more stars there, but yeah, but seven are the main ones. Yeah. Um. So, and that continued, but uh, and um, one of the ideas was that that colony would start the broadcasts, and they say they do broadcast, but I don't see real proof of that. But after a while, we became sort of disheartened by the idea that physically nothing happens. We don't remember our visits. It's more like vague dreams that we visited. Um, and the funniest part was in the channel, they said that they don't know why, because according to their technology, we should be remembering, but um, we don't. So my understanding is that there is some weird uh, matrix law which prohibits Prohib is a real proof because if I was taken and remembered, then uh, the whole situation would dramatically change. I mean, if there is like 
say 100 people visiting, meeting each other, remembering, and broadcasting that on YouTube, that would change the, the history. And I hope to change the history. But uh, it didn't happen. It didn't happen. It, became, it, it continued to be like more like a spiritual uh, movement and spiritual experience, one of those many spiritual experiences than other people have. Okay. So I believe that thing is real in, in, their, in their dimension. It's higher dimensional. But uh, it didn't bleed through enough here to create a change. So it's still more like a seed. It's still real, but uh, it's a potential seed. So once that matrix here changes enough, it can actually materialize here. But it didn't. Um, and, and in my letters, I basically suggested a plan how we work down below here and up there to create that transformation. But it looks like uh, not many of them are ready to commit. Uh, some of them are, don't commit because they are bound by galactic federation laws, like they're not allowed to interfere. Some of them are bound by their limitations. They can only negotiate and do changes uh, through the governments. I mean, the, we have elected governments. Even if it sucks, uh, it's still an elected government. So they meet with the governments and uh, negotiate and suggest that they do that help and that help. But basically, the main idea is that we have to do it ourselves. And that idea is not only their choice. I think it is, a, is a, you know, the, God, uh, the main principle of this creation is free will. It's like everything can be changed, but uh, respect of free will is, is one of the primary, primary rules of this galaxy, of this creation, of this, multi, multi, of this universe. And if you read it correctly, free will is, means free will. And free will of the humans on the planet, these billions of uh, brainwashed humans, is uh, to re retain the status quo. They don't want the aliens. You know, if the humans would vote for the candidate who would do the disclosure, that's a different thing. But the majority is still playing the games of the past. The majority still chooses to um, believe the the drama of the 20th century, or all, all, all of the all of the above. You know, fighting wars, sickness, cancer. All all of the drama is still very exciting to many humans. Yeah, I know, and, Max. Listen, I'm going to tell you something. Free will is fine and dandy, and I, and there's a lot of uh, all the contactees have given free will. Okay, um, and then you mentioned something about the governments. Okay, so here we go now. Did you know you need $50 million to run for President of the United States? Are you aware of that? Um, I, I'm not following like it's closely. I, I studied oh, it. That's, that's what you need. You need to grab 50 million bucks, put it on the table, and say, look, I'm running. All right, and then you got to pick your party. That's just in America. Okay, so... Bob, that dreams about being the president of the United States. I'm sorry, Bob, you ain't going to be the president of the United States because you don't have 50 million bucks. And that's how it works. Okay. So there's a lot of corruption. And even some of the stuff that um, we're getting into galactic laws and galactic stuff and everything else, there's a lot of people that didn't give consent on Earth. And it's not everyone. Uh, so they, or the governments don't speak for everyone. So we have a big conflict of interest going on here, and we've had a big conflict of interest for quite a long time. And quite frankly, a lot of people on Earth are getting pissed off about it. Okay? Um, period. All right. And then the, 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 the um, ETs that are here for bad purposes don't follow galactic laws. They throw it right out the window. They do whatever they want. They rape our women. They, they, they sacrifice our kids and do a lot of atrocities. They keep people like in zoos like, like, and torture them and stuff like that. So, again, when you say we got to rise up and do our stuff, yeah, but we, look, we can't do our stuff with, with a wheelbarrow, okay? We need some modern utensils to fight back. Problem numero uno, okay? We don't have the utensils to fight back. 
All right, they're going to shoot a laser beam at us. Where are we going to shoot? A 22? Like, you know, good luck. All right, this is the problem. All right, so I don't know. I just got to say it out there. Because, and it's the governments too. It's, it's, you can't trust the government, any government, right? Because they don't speak for all the people, right? From other, what I heard about other planets is they give a consensus where they have an elected uh, council. Okay, and uh, everybody is in favor for that, right? And when the elected council does something wrong, then they're replaced right away with somebody else that they have elected to replace them. Immediate, okay? And it's agreed that way. It doesn't happen like that on Earth. And Earth is ruled too much by money and greed and selfishness. It's not going anywhere fast. All right, it's just staying in a spiral of negativity, right? And um, this is the thing, right? So I've heard the stories too about galactic councils and galactic laws and stuff like that. Yeah, and universal laws and stuff like that. Yes, there should be punishments made, okay, for people that have done a lot of atrocities. And ETs that have done a lot of atrocities from other worlds that came on Earth to do the atrocities, all right? So, yes, that should be looked at. But I'm not going to be the judge right now at this moment. Maybe down the road, who knows, right? I'm just saying, right? But the, the thing is, when ETs say, well, we got to rise up. Yeah, we got to rise up. We're trying to. But we need some more ammunition. We need different types of tools here happening here, all right? We can't fight a war. It's like the medieval days. We're going to throw a rock with, with a slingshot. Meanwhile, they'll get lasers. Like, you know, there's, what are we, you're setting us up for suicide. So we're going to go fight a war. We're all going to die. And then what's going to happen, right? This is the problem. So ETs, if you're listening, problem numero uno, okay? One of the problem numero unos. A lot of these problems, right? Because you got the physical. And what, what and I think needs to be done, a good idea, as you were talking governments, have them all disappear for a couple of weeks. All of them. Trudeau, Trump, the guy in Russia there. What's his guy's name there? Putin. Putin, that's it. I like Putin, by the way. I, I really like Putin. And I like that guy from the Philippines, too. Right? You know, they speak their mind. Have them all disappear for two weeks. Now, wouldn't that be something? Mainstream media. Oh, where's Trudeau? Uh, where's Trump? Um... Okay, where's the guy in England? Oh, where's the Australian Prime Minister? They're all gone. What happened to them? And nobody knows what happened. They just all of a sudden disappear, and they're taken somewhere, and they're briefed on another planet, and then brought back. That, that, that would be something to see, right? And that would send a message, too, right, about galactic law. Yeah, let's, let's analyze that. I've analyzed meaning take it in a, a part and look at each part separately as like scientifically. <clears throat> yes. I mean that that was you asked me what happened since since then. So that was I was working on that analysis and trying to figure out why things are so screwed up and how and what to do. <clears throat> um so one thing is I think you will agree that it, the matrix is an illusion, right? Sure. It's 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 a trap, it's a prison. <clears throat> so we we are dealing with all these problems happen within the illusion, within the matrix, and the matrix needs to be transformed. But um, uh, others are not permitted to interfere uh, in a big way. Say say you know we would like to help. Like many they can help many ways. Like good good people from out there they can help by interfering in the politics. They can help by interfering in the economy by um, my favorite is by broadcasting from outside i mean if the aliens start a few youtube channels speaking as aliens on youtube channels and if not only speaking if humans would take interviews from the aliens that would be a great help i mean that doesn't happen interviews with aliens there is one video and it's like very very poor quality and there is very little said there but there's a few more out there buddy yep Right on uh, not on YouTube. Uh, anyway, so 
so may, many ways they can help uh but um they i think the main principle by which that matrix works is that there has to be maximum amount of drama that whole uh illusion is created to create maximum amount of drama and you choose your drama you choose on which level you have the drama old level is like physical survival wars sex and other stuff right food you know most of the humanity still chooses that level of drama but but even on the awakening level they also create maximum amount of drama so if you get tons of help and then there is no drama you know a good uh, aliens came and like bashar said you know their awakening was done by some jesus like person like some uh messiah he came united the whole planet in one network of telepathic people in three days and that was it in three days they awakened telepathically they became a hive a hive a hive a beehive and they were all becoming one through some magical transformation yeah they, they had the tongue of fire ignited which was the penal gland right and then he went bye-bye right that kind of thing now on earth it looks like the i'm pretty sure the drama is that we got to do it ourselves at least we we are given an illusion we are doing ourselves there is a lot of help like right now we have like aliens speaking and watching us but and maybe and if i say something wrong i i do lots of webinars right if i say something they don't like they immediately like the bzzz, like russians did how do you call it they sting you okay it, like they that broadcast jamming jamming they jumped yeah they jumped. so they will immediately jump you know that happened many times i say something they don't like they jump me but now when i'm saying what what they're okay then then the broadcast continues so so we've been watched a lot by the spirits by angels by the aliens but we get an illusion and we're doing it ourselves and and that changes so illusion and drama so these are my main points so we have to do it ourselves and um, obviously not as individuals like individual max individual J james borg not enough we have to do it as a team right and um how do we do it that's a different story so my vision on um earth transformation we know that happens like just just two days ago there was a wave of transformation which was like it there is a joke on facebook like a person is like completely crushed crawling on on their like belly and um, that's how ascent, ascension actually looks like you know when, when there is a wave of higher dimensional energy you you feel sick and you barely can move and you know when we did this c5 uh meeting under the stars uh, my belly was like killing me when the star was flashing i was like tortured with pain because there is too much of higher dimensional energy so so they send these waves of energy and the earth tra tra transformed really fast these days i see people awakening like popping up like like in the matrix movie they pop yeah remember he said now he will pop and and people pop and and they awaken right. so that is happening Popping. and that is happening in layers so some layers of society are awakening and other layers are still living in the old paradigm so speaking about flat earth that's a great illustration because mm -hmm. oh matrix matrix was developed through different ages and there is a lot of layers of um, of the code which the angels and other beings wrote so it's it's a it's a big heavy book of drama and i think the flat earth is just a set of programs which were written in mid middle centuries when the people believed that the earth is flat and this programs like it's called um uh how do you call it I'm blanking on the word. Old programs which are not used anymore. Uh, they they still. Uh, I mean, they still plugged in. So <clears throat> when you look at the window, you can't really see that the Earth is is round. So many of the programs which were written at that time, they still functional. So so there is some truth to that because it's all an illusion. Even the the round Earth is illusion, but the round Earth is a better illusion than the flat Earth because it explains more and it plugs in in a better sense so so we're dealing with a lot of programs which are um, poorly stitched together now how do we transform that i think 
But the idea of hierarchical society, maybe it's, it's going away. So looking at the governments, I think maybe is the last thing we should do. Yes, right. I agree. Uh, uh, I think As well, we are now, right? At least, yeah. At least there's a Pleiadian. I have lots of Pleiadian ideas, tribal Pleiadian ideas. Yeah, that would I, work. That would <clears> work. <throat> I really like tri tribal grassroots things. Like what happened in Russia was a grassroots event. Like the government was completely laughable. They when when the Chernobyl happened. Now there is a movie Chernobyl, uh, <clears throat> and you can see there. I I didn't watch it, but I I, I watched it a little bit. So. Well, I, I knew I was there in '96. There, I was yeah, exactly. Yeah. I was 18 years old or something. I had a relative die in that. Um, two years later, he went to Ukraine, and I think it was the vodka he brought back. Right? He drank. He uh, was made, I think, in 1988. The vodka, mm -hmm. and uh, and then he died shortly after of cancer. Now I found the bottle, and I found it was a Ukrainian vodka, and. Uh, a little voice told me, don't drink the vodka, right? Because usually if you get Russian vodka, holy cow, it's a treat. It's beautiful. It's Russian. It's, you know, vodka is from Russia, right? Uh, but a voice said, don't drink it. And then it clicked. That must have been Simon. Maybe Simon, maybe he drank the vodka. Maybe he got contaminated. Could be. Anyway, I poured it down the sink. But um, so in, eight, in 86, I graduated from the university and... Um, and then it just happened. And um, it was fear, obviously. Yeah. And there was uh, the main thing, we didn't know much. There was only rumors. And most of the news we got from, again, from broadcasts from abroad. But in the movie, you can see that the Russian leaders, they just didn't know what happened. They had so little information. They were, comp and, and later, like all the, all the years the Soviet Union was falling apart, they were the last to know what is happening. That they were not in control. They were like in charge, but not in control. They couldn't fix the situation because they didn't have the, you know, if you drive a car and not, no controls work, you know, it will crash. And that's what happened there. And that may be what is happening now because, you know, you can think that these leaders, they actually control things. They, they are manipulated. Um, I'm I'm still behind. There is very little information you can can ga gain now on what is happening now. But the events which were happening in the 60s were really well researched now. So I'm I'm reading, actually listening on Audible, listening a lot of historical books, and there is a look a great book about um, LBJ. And that's very educational to see how powerless the president is, how much he is controlled by others, and LBJ was the most able president. Others were popular, but he was the one who did the most change in America. Maybe negative change, but he actually did it. Uh, most of the laws which he were actually done, so we still live in a country which, which is governed by the laws which were passed in 66 by LBJ. So, um, we come to the idea of conspiracy, right? Uh, the conspiracy theory is great. I am a big subscriber to that theory. Lots of po arrows, lots of pointers point into the idea that there is a conspiracy. Now, last year, I would say, I started to realize that... No, it's uh, funny, Max. Being a metaphysical person, yeah. um, other people call it conspiracy. For me, it's just normal. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right, yeah. In Asia especially in China, but in, in Russia, in Asia, uh, we don't expect the government to be good. Like Americans, they are upset that the government isn't good, that they, that it's evil. In China, it's like, of course, I mean, that's yeah, supposed to be evil, right? I mean, if they want evil, they wouldn't be government, right? So in Russia, it's also like a I guess you're right Asian there. approach. I mean, you're not surprised that the president is uh, is evil because that's how things are set up and worked for thousands of years. The mind so, and only in America you're so sort of upset that the president is not an ideal person. I mean, when Clinton was caught uh, lying, people were so upset. I, as, as Russians, we were like, which which Clinton? You know, which Clinton? Yeah. 
No, no, Bill, 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 he yeah, had Bill a Clinton, yeah. with, uh, infidelity and uh, he, yeah. he, uh, he. I mean, yeah. for us, it was like nothing, right? I mean, he, he is a guy on top and he's supposed to do those things. I mean, there was no, no point, like, like Nixon would, nobody ex blamed Nixon for being, yeah. But you being, know what? Uh, I mean, I'm going to be guy. honest. I liked Bill Clinton. I did like him, right? When he was in power, I did like the guy, right? And even even after he was uh, found to be um, doing what he did, it's like okay, so he made that mistake. I said, but you know, it wasn't like he was like a Nixon guy stealing. He did the infidelity thing. Okay, well, it happens, right? It, like, you know what I mean? And they made a big deal out of it. And um, getting back to Clinton too, Bill, right? Um, he did have a lot of stuff happen in his term for, um, it was a pro-ufology, it was for UFOs, for uh, disclosure. So I'll give him that, right? The problem with the Clintons, okay, and everybody, everybody can change, is the way they are involved in other stuff that are nefarious, right? And I'm not talking about, um, I'm talking about stuff that, you know, people get killed over, okay? Stuff like that, okay? Like sacrifices, right? This is the stuff that threw everybody off, right? And, um, you know, it's not, it's nefarious. It's non benevolent, right? Right. You want leaders to be benevolent, right? And when you're damn, you know, blatantly satanic, well, there's going to be issues, right? Because most of the people are not satanic, right? And I don't have anything against people who are satanic. I have stuff of issues about people being sacrificed, killed, right? That's my issue, all right? If they want to go and worship Lucifer, worship Lucifer, whatever. It's your deal. It's not mine. It's your deal, all right? But don't kill people, especially the innocent. Anyway, I'm sorry I got a rant out, but no, no, that, that's the that's the the topic I I wanted to discuss. So, scientific question here or practical question here? I mean, okay. practical question here is how much of that is done in agreement? The conspirators, I mean, by definition, they have to agree with each other to rule the world, right? Yeah. Those Bilderbergs, um, uh, cabal. Looking from down below, you assume they are in agreement with each other and the rule of the world by agreement. They have conspiracy against good people. So that's a theory. And I was following it for a while, believing in it, but now I sort of, I studied the biography of Kissinger, who is one of those conspirators, right? Oh, for sure. Top of the list, buddy. Top right. of the list, yeah. For many decades. And Stalin, right? Biography of Stalin. Yep. Also, one of the on the top of the conspirators. Oh, for sure, he killed one of the most people. He's one of the, he killed more people than Hitler. Yeah, um, yeah, possible. Yep, yeah, of course. Yeah, I agree. So, though those conspirators, you study the biography, and there is a lot known about them. And when you study carefully, you realize they are not in agreement with each other. They fight against each other. They Big don't time. trust each other. There is no, no. The agreements are seldom rare. The mostly things happen. How do they happen if they don't agree, right? Right. And uh, I'm coming to the idea that there is uh, something supernatural happening there. That much of the conspiracy is not by humans. And if it is supernatural, there are two suspects. It's either evil aliens or evil spirits right evil demigods right mm -hmm. so and um and i'm i i'm in very privileged position i have a good channel and not one channel we have a channel in community i have channels and i'm a channeler so we can talk to them to right. the to go to the good guys we can talk to the bad guys but we can talk to the good guys and ask questions okay. and for six years i was asking questions so and it's very important what questions do we ask you know, so sure. most people ask you know, how do we, how do I keep my mate or something like that? How get more sex? 
but um, you know, we're asking questions about the conspiracy. And um, when it comes to the idea of negative demigods being in charge, that is like a blockage. I cannot get that information out. It's like they don't refuse to talk about that. But I think there is maybe some truth to that. I think, uh, and I'm not blaming that. Um, how do you call it? Anti. Uh, op the opponent. I don't blame the opponent. I think the whole matrix is designed to maximize the drama. Yeah. And to have a good drama, you need to have a supernatural entity which would uh, maximize it on the negative side. So I think maybe it's even even worth, from certain perspective, it's a, it's a worth uh, the job which is hard, but but is needed to maximize the drama. So maybe there is some some negative entity which is playing. But I think uh, my feeling is that the whole drama is to give each of us the experience of of actually winning. And um, against it is a choice. It is a free choice. It's one of the choices. If you choose to win, you win. If you choose to lose, you lose. Uh, but um, but I think we have a chance in our lifetime to win that game. And that's my main message of today. Even though we are dealing with a supernatural conspiracy, there is still a chance to win. And, and um, I mean, talking about negative entities, uh, dra draconians are coming lately, like, especially last year, they come in lately, like, in channelings and draconian energy. And it is a very interesting energy. It is pretty negative especially extremely selfish they only talk about themselves they cannot talk about anything else if it's not about themselves but on the other hand if you don't take them seriously they don't take themselves seriously too and the same thing with the supernatural conspiracy if you treat it as something super evil super strong which will kill you then it's one thing but but you should realize they it's it's a network which is which will fall apart very easily like it like the russian government it just disappeared there was nothing on the top i mean they they just like poor people who are not very smart they were selected to be not very smart and their uh, strength was only in the system when the system cracked the strength disappeared so the well, let's, let's be honest they had that guy uh, boris right yeltsin yes yeltsin wasn't he alcoholic yeah, uh -huh. big time, right? So half the job that he was always corked. So of course he let the country fall apart because he was always hammered all the time, right? So he kind of let that go to ruin, right? But if you would have put Putin in there from the very beginning or a guy like that, it would have been a different story, right? I remember when Russia, yes, when Russia fell and it became democratic, right, after Perestroika, I uh, met a women's hockey team. In, in Miami, Florida, of all places, and I couldn't believe they were Russian, right? And they're speaking me in broke, broken English, and then uh, they're giving me their phone numbers and stuff like that. And then I got letters from Russia, and I said, wow, they really were Russian, right? I thought they were Czech or Polish, right? Because I didn't know how to differentiate the Russian language, right? And um, they were telling me stories of stuff they didn't have. Right, so it was hard the first few years, yes, under Boris, right? But then they gradually got ahead. And then which opened up the black market. They had a problem with the black market, right? Because right. you could, um, there's a lot of stuff you could only get on the black market. But uh, they prevailed. They prevailed and they're one of the most uh, dominant forces of the planet right now, right? I would have to agree, right? Yeah, it's really hard to tell what would happen if it went right. I mean, yeah, the falling apart of Russia went mm, mediocre. It was mediocre. It was like lots of hopes failed. But on the other hand, lots of fears also didn't materialize. The worst thing was Chernobyl. Yes. Uh, Moscow, like, I, w I remember like, it was like a few months. I was walking through Moscow. I had a little radio. I was listening all the time. At that time, already, like in the 90s, already there was a Russian station which broadcasted the truth. Like was one station, right. only in Moscow. But, and it was broadcasted using some, just one single transmitter. But you can hear the truth. So I was listening to the truth. And um, actually, Radio Svoboda from 
uh, Radio Liberty from Prague was reading the book about kind of post-apocalyptic book about the city falling apart. And I was expecting any time Moscow to fall apart because there was time electricity would completely disappear. There was time when the water would stop. And can you imagine a huge city like 10 million people without water and electricity? It's just, it, um, in the worst time, of, I, I'm, I'm always running away. Like as a Jew, that, I'm that kind of Jew who is always looking like, if things go worse, where should I run? I mean, from San Diego, is it Hawaii or China or where should they go? Or maybe Mount Shasta, where should they go if things go get to worse, right? So um, at some point I ran away to the north, to the far north, because it was like, you're hungry. The kids, my kids were hungry. I had two small kids and I couldn't feed them. I mean, the money didn't, didn't buy anything. It was like completely like destroyed system. And in the north there was butter. Can you imagine butter? Kids like were like eating butter we all were eating butter because right. you can with that Moscow money, which in Moscow didn't buy anything, in the north, like close to the you know far north, yeah. uh, the the economy still worked. The money still still paid for the stuff. You can buy butter and bread. It was amazing. So, um, but I lived through that experience that still things will fall apart any time now, and there was so many education they would fall apart. But, but we kind of went through and uh, survived and there was nothing too bad. But both of my parents died not because of the hunger, because they couldn't fit in a new system. They couldn't find the meaning of life in the new system. Okay. Like one of them was, uh, my mother was a scientist and you know, in not nonsense, the science just stops working. And um, my stepfather, he was, uh, an administrator, and you know, when <laughs> there is no administration, what do you administrate? So, um, so I assume, I assume, I mean, it's you know, we have because the because the drama has to be maximized. I assume there are many ways of moving forward, and obviously, we always will have that complete like chaos and destruction in front of us, and and you can imagine what would happen. I mean, there is so many. It's it's the movies already model it's really well, and I see most of the Americans don't know how to live in a primitive society like Russians. We are trained to like do go camping and live there for a year or several years. We we will survive. We just have lots of training like that because you know if they need to fix the car, we just go and fix the car. Yeah. If the, that car cannot be fixed, we take two cars and assemble one from two, from the you two. Make do with what you got exactly. You be yeah. what's called meek. Meek. The definition of meek means not fragile. It doesn't mean weak. It means being like a MacGyver, being yeah. crafty, being yeah. imaginative. Right. Yeah, we are trained trained to survive the not situations, but um, exactly. That is one of the scenarios. Um, and my favorite scenario is that the government gradually loses the, the, the power, but the crowd gains the power. And the crowd gains the power in a tribal way. So I, I'm looking, I'm, I know from the history, especially from the history, of, that all uh, the fruits in the future already are growing now. Basically, everything that will happen then already has some roots here. It's not something that comes from outside. It's something that we have here in the little quantities will, will just uh, blossom. And right now I see a big transformation happening in, their, in America and everywhere in the world. One of that is uh, uh, Uber, Uber Lyft. And um, some other systems like, um, uh, say, guru.com and freelancers. Freelancers. It is when you don't have an employer, when you are self employed and you just sell your work directly to other people through the computerized system. So it is artificial intelligence, unfortunately, uh, which allows people to work for themselves without any bosses. And it does it really well, actually, with Uber and stuff. I know that Uber is not profitable, and it possibly will 
crash at some point. It's it's losing money. But but the system of <clears throat> people working for others without having any structure on top of them, I think that's the future. I think that's one of the possible futures. By the way, in Toronto, um, Uber is number one. More mm -hmm. people take Uber than taxis now. But you got to admit, a lot of, uh, like in places like Toronto, the taxi industry destroyed itself because they were dishonest to people, right? The biggest thing with a taxi cab is, uh, you know, people that go, like the, people like to go and party, right? So they don't drink and drive. They take a cab, right? On the way back, the cabbie's robbed with people, right? Because they take advantage, right? I've many, t many times... I've been led a little run around where they take the long route or they drive around in a circle like that, right, to, to jack up the fare, right? And um, this is why a lot of people don't take taxis no more, right? And now imagine the whole economy working uh, on Uber style. Like everything, all businesses. Okay. So you basically, you want to work now on that type of work, say, um, you know, painting the walls or something else, which is, you do like dance, yeah, dance, creative. And you just plug in, go and do it. And um, do it. Craig Lee already has some of that, like it's called gigs. You can uh, look for gigs and you find an employer and go and do it. But That's a good way. It, it's a very yeah. good way. But now imagine the, the whole planet doing that. It's right. Uh, how many people work from home uh, in San Diego? I work from from the beach. I, I'm serious. I I have my uh, paid internet connection. I found the spots. I mapped the spots on the beach where the internet connection is good. Nice. And, and I bought a laptop with a screen which is pretty bright, so you can uh, actually work in the shadow. The the sun doesn't blind you. And um, the energies of the ocean is are very therapeutic. So oh, I work and then I walk on the ocean. I work again and I work more than other people work, but I work on the beach. I mean, that's nice. my working place. Fantastic. It's, it's nice. pretty hard. It's pretty hard, especially when it's you know, um, hot. And um, so some, some, some weeks I have to, to work from home. But if the weather permits and if... I, okay. Now what I'm working on, um, let me jump on that because we sure. might run out of time soon. Um, so, where do I start? Yeah, I start so with the. Uh, you want a break, Max, or are you okay? Uh, how much more time do we have? Well, we got about another 20 minutes, give or take. Let, let's use them for that. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so the medicine is in a crisis, right? You, you know, everybody knows that. You know, chemicals are poisoning everybody. And, um, and the body, in fact, is a hologram. And this hologram is structured by the DNA. DNA is a real chemical molecule. And in this matrix, it's pretty physical. You can extract it and uh, see it in a tube as a material. And it is present in every cell of our body. And uh, it's a pretty long molecule. It is 3 billion bases. And it contains information about how much you put in a couple of file, file cabinets, like maybe thousands of books, something like that. In every cell, there is that information, and we know the sequence, A, G, 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 T, um, four letters, A, G, C, T. So these four letters uh, in, in the sequence write the code of our genome, and this is the main program which we are running. And uh, the genome of humans, genome of dolphins, genome of um, uh, plants, bacteria, octopuses, you know, they, their genomes define their shape, who they are, and what soul can land in that body. So the soul attaches to the embryo as it grows and helps it grow. And as it grows bigger and bigger, it, more and more of the soul gets in. And the interface between this physical body and the spiritual world is through DNA, which vibrates. And it vibrates according to the code, A, G, C, T. To play a tune, play a tune. Yeah. Now, now, the mind, part of the mind is physical in the body. Like if you drink alcohol, you know the mind changes. So physicality affects your, your mind. You hurt yourself, your mind feels it. But part of the mind, especially intuition, is 
elsewhere in the spiritual world and is connected to the brain through the DNA in the brain. You can say pineal gland, but in every cell, sometimes you can feel how you think through your belly. Much of the thinking and much of the memory is stored elsewhere. There are documented cases where there's organ transplant, and as you transplant the organ from one person to another, the new person gets the memory, memory. of the old person. Yeah. Yeah. So some of the information is stored in the organ, but mostly it's not the information. It's a barcode of DNA, which reads that information from the other dimension. And when you get that barcode, you can read that information easier because you have the barcode of another person. Isn't so that, humans have... Is it, no, think about it. It's like we're a walking computer, right? Like, okay, so I have the name Borg. Everybody jokes I'm a machine or whatever, Borg, right? Mm -hmm. But you know what? In reality, what you're just saying just proves it's like an organic computer. We're an organic yep. computer. And this computer has a code, and we know the code. It's, it was sequenced in 2000. So for 19 years, the scientists sit on the code. So see three billion letters. We know all the letters. And we have the computer programs to analyze the letters. And the humanity, the mainstream science, is all only looking for drugs, for drug targets. It's called drug targets. So you find a gene. If you can affect the gene with that chemical, then you can sell this, this chemical as a drug and be as rich, you know, be rich. And the, the model drugs is um, antibiotics, aspirin, Tylenol, you know, the, the the ones on the shelf in the store. The, the whole economy is built on those drugs. Prescriptions, yes. Yeah, and um, the new drugs are more sophisticated, but, uh, so they, they have the designer proteins, which treat arthritis, and they're pretty good. They're pretty good. And uh, so designer proteins, so design the ge genetically designed new proteins, create them, and then you inject them, and uh, they treat some, some sort of disbalances in the body. So... That's what, what the science is working on. What it is missing is the vibrational component of DNA. So no mainstream science, no science is funded. I know that for sure. No science is funded to study the vibrational component of the DNA. So most of the scientists look at the chemical side of DNA, how the DNA makes proteins, DNA, RNA proteins. So, so this is a small fraction of the genome, and it is only a part of the code. The rest of the code, which is responsible for the vibrational communication with the spirit, for communication with the mind, the outer mind, the spiritual mind, intuition, that nobody is studying. So me and uh, very few people, like maybe a couple of people who work with me, we are working on that. And we're making progress. We, I think, already see in the last few years and few months, we, uh, we see the traces of resonance in the DNA. Just carefully looking at the sequences. This sequence talks to that sequence and they resonate to each other through a certain uh, pattern. So we look at chemistry. I'm trained as a chemist and I can see the patterns, chemical patterns of the bonds and how they resonate with each other. So it's physically like... And what resonates is not the main heavy bulk molecule. It's electrons resonating there. Like electrons are light and they just, it's more like a radio, more like a cell phone. So uh, the science about that is actually pretty popular in Russia. Again, it's not funded, but it's popular among people and among like amateur, amateur science, alternative scientists. So I have connections to Russian scientists who studied that. And um, there, I hope to make a major breakthrough by discovering the code, reading the genome and discovering the code. I call it vibrational code or resonance code. So once we are able to read what is written there, uh, that will make a huge change in science. I think it will be a major, a major impact. Like since uh, Einstein and maybe discovery of the double helix, it would be a major, uh, a major breakthrough in science because we will understand the vibrational nature of medicine, of the body, of biology. And we'll see how the soul plugs into the body. And it, uh, I, I know, like I know, it's it's prohibited only until it becomes commercial. So if you can commercialize the the discovery, then it becomes ma mainstream right away. It happened before. 
Uh, and here I see the applications, uh, say, growing new teeth, growing new limbs, growing new organs, changing your body, transforming your body. And most importantly, I think it is a key to mind because I think the mind works through resonances and DNA. And once you can synthesize those resonances in the helmet, for example, then you can build an interface or resonance interface to the computer. And you can you plug have, in it. They already have it. There's a, there's a Dr. Persinger and right. said he invented the helmet. Or, yeah, I, 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 I'm, I'm, I, I've applied for grants on that. I, I researched the field. I think they, they're doing okay. They, they can uh, use electromagnetic impulses to communicate to the electric uh, events in the neurons. But until you know the role of DNA in there, I think it's, it's like very primitive technology. It doesn't go into information. Basically, you can plug into the electric... Uh, already existing senses. So there is existing senses, which is like hearing and vision. So you can uh, send electromagnetic signals to stimulate the visual parts of the brain and hearing parts of the brain. Then it's possible because it's macro, it's, it's bigger. Yeah. But I believe uh, once you know the code of the DNA, the resonance code of DNA, the, it will like, like going from tiny modem, like whatever, 512, I forgot the unit, 512 bits per second to, to terabyte internet. So, so I think once we get that, uh, it's called uh, synthetic telepathy. It was right. uh, described a long time ago, but basically once you get that, you can plug your brain to another brain. So imagine the teams of people who are completely connected through thr high throughput. So they, they temporarily, you put on the helmet, you become one mind. You can think better. And that's, that's how much, uh, exactly what you said right there is how most e ETs communicate, right? Right. Up, right up there, right? And some of them, they need helmets. Some of them have like little implants and some of them do it naturally. So we are playing with uh, natural depending telepathy on, too. Depending on the ET, right? Right, right. ETs. So like best, Yayela yeah, best. Uh, Yayela yeah, tall grays basically. Tall grays are best in that. Uh, they have better index of telepathy and everybody else is like somewhere in between. Um, telepathy is not one, not the main, I mean, you can have different levels of telepathy. Uh, and we, we are like, we also are telepathic. I know we are telepathic. Uh, all, I always work with the bosses who were like strong personalities and they used me as an external brain. I would be silent in the meetings and we had, they had a lot of meetings, but just looking at me, they knew what I was thinking and they would say that aloud. You know, that is like a normal thing. Humans do telepathy all the time like that. It's lots of, you know, people who become bosses, they become because they can read minds. Right. And can, they can affect minds, not only read, they can affect minds. The willpower affecting mind. So that comes to ideas of yoga and energy healing and energy manipulation. So many of us, many of you are practical magicians, but, you know, going from like um, a primitive level of doing that to, um, to collective mind, I think it will be a major leap. Sure. And um, as, as, as I talk to the aliens through the channelers, I understand that we will have to develop our own telepathic language. And the telepathic language doesn't necessarily have to be like English or Russian or Chinese. It will be developed as a, something better than what can be so pronounced with sound. Because Bashar, the, the alien, high, higher dimensional alien, he says that in their language, which is telepathic, they don't have those funny, how do you call them? Uh, Omonyms, I think they're called omonyms, the words where the same word means two different things. Right. It, in English, it's all, all the time. And that's good. But, uh, so the language becomes much more uh, precise. Precise and information content becomes higher. Like uh, I got told that dolphins have a trinary language, so they transmit uh, the same message in three different frequencies, and, and that helps them to be better connected. So they are maybe collectively they're way smarter than they are telepathic and we are not. 
we are very pre we have very primitive but i think um what will uh, be a major leap for humanity either we create helmets and create communities of people connected telepathically voluntarily or um maybe we'll learn telepathic language and then we can take helmets and continue telepathically com to communicate yeah so i think well, once on that topic i'm gonna uh, audrey are you there audrey Lewis? i'm here hey beautiful okay look max you're talking about telepathy this is audrey Lewis. he's probably the numero uno person on the planet right now in telepathy so audrey do you have any questions for max Well, you, you understand with telepathy that it's a form of intention, a form of binary, like a uh, when we speak in telepathy, we're not speaking generally in English or any language you know here. It's a language of intention, more of action. And entire conversations can be said in one small sitting and a small packet of information transmitted from one individual to another. That package can contain emotions, uh, imagery, actions, sometimes even forms of words, but really it is mostly intention. Every single thing in this universe speaks on a level of intention, no matter what language they may know in their brains and are able to maybe verbalize with their voices they can speak on a level of intention to everything around them. So every single thing, whether it be a rock, a being, a planet, a star, whether it be, you know, an animal, a plant, it doesn't matter what it is. Everything has a form of consciousness, has a form of communication. So it can be a small consciousness or a large consciousness, and they all speak at different speeds. Not everything speaks in your time. So a rock can talk much slower than a plant and still have more knowledge and information than, let's say, a human. Every single thing here has a consciousness. So with telepathy, when I communicate with someone telepathically, I do try to send chains of thoughts to them. When you send intention to someone's brain, it is translated from intention into the language that they know, which is why, let's say, a Zeta is able to communicate with you in your head and it sounds like they're speaking English, but they don't know English. Um, okay, I think we just went off live, but we are still recording, so I will keep talking. And the reason why is because my server is running low on resources oh, okay audrey by the way thank you for um like uh, finally talking to max and max there you go you just talked to a palladium absolutely um well zetas they all communicate on a level of intention so do other beings but i'm using them as an example a zeta is they do not speak with voice so it may sound like they're speaking, let's say, English or Russian into your head, but really all they're doing is transmitting intention into your brain directly through te telepathy. Again, the binary, the lowest form of language, the most efficient form of language universally throughout the universe. So this is something that people here in this world still have yet to understand. They still have yet to understand intention. Which is why, let's say, witchcraft is based on words. They try to form intentions rather than transmitting intention, if that makes sense. Yeah. Are you still there, Max? Yeah, let, let me ask you a question. Um, Go ahead. So, uh, galactic languages, light languages. Um, I found uh, we, we started speaking light languages in, um, in our community, and we do it online, and uh, we have wonderful recording where uh, nine people speak Arcturian language and they tell the same story, just taking turns. It was amazing. Um, so I, I developed my language and I'm trying to remember my language, which is, and, and the language that comes, 
I don't know the source of it yet. I assume it's from Pleiades, but maybe you can recognize it. Let, let me give you a sample. But that is a raw language without transmitting telepathy. Um, what I'm speaking about is actually transmitting telepathy directly into somebody's brain. Uh, mm -hmm. directly speaking into somebody's mind with telepathy to create a conversation without using any sound at all. But in your head, you hear the language start to form in your head in the language you know. This is what intention does. So when you are transmitting telepathy, it doesn't matter what language someone speaks, they understand what you're saying. All right. So how would you suggest to develop um, telepathy in communities? Uh, telepathy in communities can be, be encouraged by using um, meditation as a form of communication. When they're all meditating, it puts their brain into a debug mode where they're able to actually access their pineal glands a little more easily. And then they need to know who they're trying to reach. Now, you know the person by their frequency. Every soul has its own slightly different frequency. It vibrates just a little bit differently, which is how we know who we're talking to. So it doesn't matter what body the soul is in. If you know that soul's frequency, you can communicate directly with that individual. So it's like a cosmic telephone book. It's like a cosmic contacts list, and your telepathy is like a cosmic cell phone. Does that make sense? Oh, sure. Yeah. So the frequency of a soul is like the phone number mm -hmm. that you would dial to reach somebody. So if you communicate with that individual often, you get to naturally know their frequency. Then when you focus in on that specific frequency next time you want to talk to them, you're able to send a message directly to that person. Now, the best way is usually to visualize what you what you believe they look like. You know, and uh, it doesn't really matter what their outside appearance is, but the way that their soul make it makes an image in your mind when you communicate to them. You know, it's a way to memorize their frequency. Does that make sense? Yeah. Uh even with the small resources, I think we are moving pretty well. And I'm finding that the research and um, we are getting the code out. I think we have the major breakthrough already have been done. We already see the, the traces of resonance code of DNA, but it will take some uh, effort to convert the theoretical knowledge that there is some resonance and understanding of the sequences into the practical application of that, which is, um, I think there are two major applications. One is health, um, physical health and wellness. Uh, we should be able to create a device which amplifies good vibes and uh, um, controls the shape of the body, controls the growth of the cells and can uh, improve some parameters and can reduce, rebalance basically. It's, I would call it um, a Reiki device, uh, a Reiki device. So Reiki is energy healing device and now it's done purely by humans without technology, but I think we could create a Reiki glove which would amplify what the healer sends or maybe would recreate or copy what the healer does. And the second thing I think is uh, related to, to electronic drugs. Basically, we should be able to modify the mind work, improve the mind work, improve the moods and create the drugs which would enhance the work of the brain. So these are major applications, um, and uh, my estimate, maybe it would take about $15 million, and it's not that much money. I mean, I'm looking at the window, I see that building is like $15 million, another million. So it's, it's, it's not a huge amount of money. There is a lot of uh, resources around that, but I estimate we need good uh, experts in certain areas where um, to, to, to bring together different parts of the science. So 
first experiments would be done with using um, spectroscopy, meaning like you do biological DNA samples and you do spectroscopic analysis of the frequencies and you do both analysis and influence you shine different waves on the different sequences and uh, learn how to manipulate the dna activity basically open and close it through through the vibrations it would be uh the waves and also the electric currents it's uh that field is called um uh, bioimpedance Max, right? I gotta, I gotta remember, you have one, one, one second hold that thought please all right because this is very pertinent to what you're saying that could fast track everybody so okay there's a lot of people that done hallucinogenic drugs uh -huh. so what are these drugs okay so we got we got magic mushrooms uh -huh. Ivan. we got peyote we got mescaline uh, we got lsd uh -huh. then we have dmt which is manufactured inside our penile gland okay uh -huh. and then we have uh, Alaska and Iboga and there's probably a couple other ones I haven't mentioned now the effects of some of these drugs many of them vary depending on what drug and what amount so it's like somebody taking um, a good dose of peyote and uh, once the peyote kicked in it's like when they're moving their hand they themselves see this trail of light right mm-hmm or they see auras around everything, right? Some people, depending on, again, which hallucinogenic, can see um, other beings. The beings are now the ghosts that you normally can't see. All of a sudden, poof, you're there. You can see them, right? You can see them, and you can say, wow, look at that one, right? And, um, and they get, get right in your face, right? Because now they're aware that you could see them, and it's on a sort of like a mutual level of understanding uh this is that needs to be discovered with all these topics you're talking about this is also can be used in telepathy for humans to fast track a bit right right now, it needs to be looked at from a scientific level on a serious note mm -hmm. uh, big time right mm -hmm. huge and i think um the secret governments have uh, already done this prior, right? Uh, like uh, they, they have some tools, but uh, they didn't crack the code yet. I know that. No, no, they didn't, right? And um, anyway, what I'm saying is very useful, right, to all this. Right. right. So many of the drugs, uh, like I had a, even a good trip on the marijuana. Marijuana is legal here and... Uh, it really depends on your state and on where you're going. Oh, so right? it's California marijuana is legal, yes? Yeah, yeah. Just go buy it. You know, okay. drive a license. So is there any amount of marijuana or yeah, like you can, you know, smoke it like all day long. No, can I buy like five pounds and put it in my trunk and carry it around and Yeah, nobody cares. Five pounds. <laughs> I mean it's 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 not more expensive than cigarettes. It's the same price. Okay, but you can have large amounts of marijuana? Sure. Okay, because in Canada, it's reduced to um, one ounce or less, right? No, it's not regulated here yet. I mean, they just approved it like a year ago, so it's, it's Wild West. Okay, wow. <laughs> that's, that's amazing. Uh, how about edibles? Is that legal in California? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Oh, wow. I, I prefer edibles. I cannot smoke. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, I found that I, I cannot take too much because I become dysfunctional. My work is suffering because it disconnects you from the physicality. You... you you are out there, but you're not here anymore, right? So um, I do only trips once in a while to, uh, as, as therapeutic. I mean, it is, sure. it is, it is therapeutic. And um, it is conscious, basically. You plug into a certain consciousness and you plug in, into the world where other people already created the momentum. Right. And Terence McKenna, Terence McKenna talks a lot about that. So... Okay. When you smoke one thing, you go into one world, and the the shamans which smoke the same thing, they created that that consciousness, and right. you interact with it. And right. when you smoke one, you go and different different strands of marijuana bring in different dim dimensions. But it's the art, spiritual art, to get high 
it's 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 a muscle it's a skill it, I mean, to fly, you have to learn to fly. I mean, exactly. one person smokes marijuana, he gets down, and another person eats a little bit and gets really high. So, and, and it's not my will. Like on some days, like on tiny, like do, like half a dose of marijuana, I I usually take it as meditation. So I go to the bed at night, I, I go meditate. And um, I was able to do like the whole trip like the same you get on on magic mushrooms i was out there and there uh there is a consciousness as you basically talk to them you not not in the words but you they guide you through your transformation it's it's a purposeful transformation and the dry essence of that they you have to get rid of the luggage and they say you know that's your trauma is it still dear to you do you want to hold on to it or do you want to get rid of it you still would remember it, but it's not blocking you anymore. You can fly, you know, without that fear. Yeah, we caught releasing the anchors. Yep. For me, like the biggest fear was uh, uh, secret services. I was like always like in Russia, secret services rule the, the 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 that part of the world for sure. And uh, for me, it was a huge fear. And last year, I think I, I. I'm still afraid. Not that I'm not afraid, but it's not as emotional as it was before. It became mental. It went from emotional level to mental. I'm afraid, but I, I'm not panicking yet. So, um, in terms of electronic drugs, there are already a nice system. It's called Mind Machines. Uh, and you can buy a pretty good Mind Machine. It's called Prasign for two, a used one you can buy for $150 on Amazon. Pretty cheap. They're pretty good, and uh, the first one, the first time I used it, so at that time I was playing with this system where you have to uh, clar clairvoyantly uh, see what will happen in the future, like a few seconds in the future. So, like no, one day in the future, you guess what, what the computer will show you tomorrow, and it's online system, it's called um, Remote View Daily, Remote View Daily. So you can go there and you will uh, just describe, I will see tomorrow, say, a pyramid or a president or a dollar bill or whatever, a cube, a red cube. And tomorrow you see what the computer will show you. So when I did the mind machine, it is sound and uh, lights, colored lights, very beautiful. Uh, sound pulsing, lights and music. And uh, it synchronizes your brain and makes it more coherent. And wow. when you're more coherent, you can see in the future. So I, I guessed it right. And um, and since then, I sort of learned that pattern to do it without without the machine. But but basically, it's it's a training to be more coherent. Uh, but again, it is very primitive at the moment. It's just light and sound, and that's that's about it. But I think we can do way more than that. We can actually learn the the language of the brain which is um i think is the language of dna and language of the brain is the same thing it's a resonance language it's a pretty sophisticated hologram and um because we know the letters of the dna we have the whole book we just need to read it okay so, so uh, i think the first we need spectroscopists then we need um the people who can model the dna in 3d i i have i have i'm modeling it in 3d but it's the whole art of doing uh, stereochemistry. And um, then we need quantum physicists and quantum chemists who can calculate the vibrations, which I cannot do. It's, it's way beyond my, my, my capabilities. I, I can imagine, I can channel it, I can see it, but put this model on a computer and model it in the computer is, I think that would be one of the steps. And it's trivial for them. I just... They're not funded to do that. Once you hire them, they can do that. The students this, can. Is, this is where you need that helmet that uh, we're talking sure. about, Bruce's helmet, right? Um, yeah. Like, you put somebody yeah. on the Alaska or something like that, and wow. Right? Gonna, yeah, yeah. I, I, I do that. I take marijuana, and um, I get a trip, and I come back with the – I have my recorder with me, and in the morning I say, you know, next step is that, that, and that. But, you know – if I have the whole answer, it's too complicated for me to take. It's uh, to understand you need to do it step by step. 
sure. and when I'm oh. when it's only me and a couple of workers with me, oh, yeah. we move with the speed of three people. If we get a team of twenty people, then we'll move way faster. Way fa fast, fast. Yeah. yeah, if it's a, it's a whole. I mean, if eventually the whole science of Earth will forget about developing new chemical drugs and will switch to understanding the vibrational nature of biology. But right now, it's like three people working on that. Well, you're, okay, so it's like the Jewish um, uh, tree of life, right? Uh, so, yeah, we're looking at that. It's, you know, uh, especially in that group, which is uh, light languages, they draw this DNA structures, they channel them. And I'm trying to combine the idea of, uh, yeah, Kabbalistic tree of life, uh, uh, flower of life, all of that, um, cube of Meta Metatron's cube, to find how it overlays with the DNA. It's, yeah. it's multidimensional, so we see only, only three-dimensional shape of the DNA. But, but that's, that's the, the idea. It's, it's solvable. That puzzle is solvable. We already see, we already made a major step forward. We already see the resonance of there. We sort of look at the chemical structure and see how it can uh, vibrate. Right, and yeah. see how different sequences vibrate, and then we know the sequence, what the function of the sequence is, because it's mapped by biologists. So we have all the data, and we're just explaining the data of others. Uh, there's huge genomic databases, and once once we have the code, we could uh, predictively explain how it works and explain how the DNA governs the biology. So, uh, yeah, and I have the help of channelers, and I'm channeling myself. So it's 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 a project, but we see already how it will un unfold. Obviously, anything can be used negatively, and the first use for this electronic drugs is to brainwash people. And right now, they use it for um, uh, controlling the enemy. Say they fight; they, they have like training wars or practicing. They practice mind, mind the skull technology. Yeah, practicing in 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 the in, in, in the Middle East or elsewhere they can control the crowds they can control sure. the put thoughts in your heads yeah they they try to control the leaders i mean why do you need to fight them if you just can kind of tell them tell them what to do right well they do that in america and in canada right now right, like right. I, I believe i'm a victim of that many times over yeah but uh, i believe their technology is primitive they can transmit the the message but they don't know the code they don't know the how the brain works so so once <laughs> once we know uh, then um more things become possible good things and negative things but i think that's the way forward and um uh, yeah now but okay i'm going to say something I, um um max too you said that they don't know the code right yep uh, hang on a second here so we do have secret projects going on yes that mainstream science mm -hmm. does not know about right Mm -hmm. So I think that they know a lot more than we think that they don't know, right? So I think they're they they're uh, well adept at uh, a lot of the stuff we talk about already. It's just a lot of the science, a lot of scientists are working for the black book uh, projects. Yeah, I, I I research that there is a lot of literature on that conspiracy and especially on on secret projects. Basically, the problem with those secret projects is that they have to keep them secret. And once you keep them secret, they become so isolated from the truth, they cannot function. So it's very limited what they can actually do with uh, hired uh, military scientists. Uh, there is no sense of community. It's so f fractioned. It's so separated, fragmented, that uh, the research there is pretty pretty slow i mean in terms of uh, killing machines yes they, they 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 learn how to do material things they they have possibly propulsion they have uh, other ways electronic weapons they, that that they can do but you know one thing is to harm people i mean harm people with waves is really easy so they have that like microwave guns or something like that wow. uh, millimeter wave guns but uh talk to the mind non-destructively it's way harder. You have to learn the language of the mind. I know they don't have it because it leaks in uh, references. It leaks out telepathically. I know. I know they don't have it. It's not discovered on Earth. The aliens have it, 
but the earthens are not given that yet. Okay. Uh, but they can they, they have the uh, synthetic telepathy they do have. It's, it's sort of a little bit damaging, so their subjects are kind of a little bent. They can put them, they can program. I mean, Kennedy Assassin said in an interview, video interview of Kennedy Assassin said, uh, oh, wait a second. John Lennon, sorry, sorry. John Lennon's assassin okay. uh, said that, you know, at the moment I just heard a voice in my mind and now, you know, shoot. I mean, that's wow. on video on YouTube. Uh, they already had it in 60 and 70, 90, 1980. 80, 80, yeah. They have that. So it's like 39 years ago, they already had the way to put voices in your mind. It's pretty trivial. All right. So, um, but the positive future, I think, is awareness. Once the humanity awakens to that idea, once it becomes a, you know, a topic of discussion that uh, exactly the DNA vibration and the, the science can do it, the technology can do it, and then there is interface between your DNA vibration and the nature vibration and the technology vibration, the whole mindset will change. And uh, Obviously, it can be misused, but it also that can be controlled in a way. So I'm very hopeful about that. Good. I'm very hopeful you get a lot of good results. And I'm I'm inviting the investors. So uh, we have the formalized. We have a company, and um, we have a sister company which does uh, mainstream. How do you say um, commercial mass market devices? So so it's uh, it's it's a real thing. We have a real thing in uh, in America. Max, we're we're at a very we're, we're at a very good predicament right here with the show going on right now. Uh, we were not on the we weren't we weren't live when mm -hmm. we started. I don't know what happened there, but it, it happened. So um, the, the computer of Audrey was Audrey was overloaded, but now it's working. Yeah, now it's working. So from uh, Audrey just messaged me, we're two minutes from the top of the second hour, and the shows are usually two hours. So Max, you're willing to go one more hour, and this way maybe you and Audrey can talk a lot more because you're a scientific mind, and Audrey's Audrey's everything. Like he's he's right in the science, and this way you guys can bond well together. What do you think? Uh, so you're asking how long can I talk more? Yeah, I'm, I'm inviting you to talk for one more hour, only because the radio station only had one hour so far, right? I know we've talked a lot longer, and, you, and everybody listening to the radio can get the YouTube video and BitChute video, and you'll get the full interview. But for the... Um, yeah, I need to take a little break, and after that I can talk, no problem. Okay, so um, we're going to be taking a little break, everybody, about a 10-minute break. Maybe you can play some uh, Robert Plant or something like that. And uh, Okay, everybody, thank you for rejoining us. I'm having a... This is James Murphy with Furry Chronicles, and I'm having an amazing discussion with Mr. Max Rempel. And also Hello. Adrios, and um, we missed part of the uh, programming on the radio, but we have it on video. So the, don't don't uh, fret. We'll have the the video up and running as soon as we do a couple edits, and um, you'll see the full video that you didn't get to hear on the radio. But we're back on the radio now, and we're talking to Adrios and Max Rempel. Max, um, now that you met Adrios, and you're both science related uh did you want to um have a discussion between the two of you about any topic you can pull out of your head all right Hello, oh, max what is your understanding of photoradionics um empirical it's mostly empirical um some of that happen uh, some of their very primitive technologies. They um, are done by enthusiasts at um, at the West, but in Russia there is the tradition of doing that, <clears throat> and there is much less um, censorship on that. So in Russia there is like an explosion of different devices using um, light, sound, and um, magnetic electromagnetic pulses and and electricity. So I think the most promising is bioresonance and bioresonance spectroscopy. And it's, uh, it's not only the frequencies that you apply, you, um, 
apply them to different acupuncture points and I think they, they do pretty good progress, but I think they do it uh, empirically and there is, it's not scientifically studied, it's more like commercially just commercialized. So there are some inventors who create it, make it into a product and sell it, but, but I think the research is pretty primitive. And um, we are looking at that and uh, most interesting I think is uh, bioresonance, bioimpedance and uh, millimeter wave ter therapy. So millimeter, millimeter waves uh, just recently came to the news as 5G. 5G works in millimeter waves. It's the thickness of that pen is about eight millimeters here. And that's the wavelength of the electromagnetic waves. And that's by the you know, seven millimeters, 7.1 is one of the most therapeutic wavelengths. And I believe, I don't know for sure, but I believe it could be one of the main resonance frequencies of DNA. So when 5G really starts propagate, to propagate, and I think it happens like these days outside of the uh, America and uh, main European countries, but I think it's, they already started in some other countries. Maybe I think they started in China. So. America is sort of sitting and waiting for the, to see the results. But I think the results could be either positive or negative or mixed. I expect mixed results. I think from my understanding, I have this uh, you know, seven millimeter devices here at home. They, they look like just, just, I don't have anything, but you know, at about this size. And it can be made actually much smaller. It's like a cell phone. And, uh, uh, First experience is that calmness. I mean, you, you apply it, it doesn't really actually matter where you apply it because it goes through the whole body, it kind of saturates the body, goes through the blood. And in a few seconds, I would say 20 seconds, you feel your anxiety kind of comes down and you become calm. And it's a great tool for meditation and it reduces pain. So people suffering from any pains would like it actually. So, a small amount of this seven millimeter wave therapy is really great. And it also induces you into meditative state. So it opens you up, it opens your energies and it reduces coherence in your body. And I really liked it until I overused it. I, I started using it daily. I have that device still. And in a few days, my joints became good. So I started playing volleyball. And after volleyball, I would, I would use it again, like on my knee, and I felt great until there was a crisis. And the crisis was so bad that I stopped it. And the crisis was, I think, oh, it was, by the way, it was, um, this was a little bit supernatural. You know, this, uh, you know, Max, I'm jealous there. You're playing volleyball in California, and I'm up here in Canada. In the rain. On the beach, yeah, on the beach. Yeah. Yeah, yes. Um, in November, right? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so, you know, dwarves uh, from this uh, um, something of the ring and all, all of those movies, the dwarf people, you know, they're real. They exist in certain dimensions and they are um, elements of earth. They work with gold and they're alchemists. So these dwarfs, like human dwarfs, came as a team, opposite team, and they just crushed us. They were so good in volleyball. They jumped, they were like really short. They would jump really high, hit really hard, and it just hurt me. The whole body, I was like shaken. And I was open to this energy because of the, of the millimeter wave therapy, uh, MWT, MWT, it's, it's abbreviation for that therapy, 5G therapy. Anyway, after that attack, I had a spiritual attack, and I also had, um, I just crushed. I don't use it as much anymore. Okay. But, but what I'm saying, it has a positive effect. It's like, in a, if you use any soul-opening drugs and go into the world, you, you will catch something, right? Oh, you will sure. catch yeah. some yeah. energy. So I think they will first experiment on, maybe on Chinese, because Chinese are like a way ahead than in 5G technology already. Like, I think they're deploying it already. And uh, Musk's, uh, Elon Musk's um, satellites now already on flying in the, uh, on the orbit. And they are, I looked it up. I, it, it's not shown in the news yet, but 
If you look it up on Wikipedia and restore the wavelengths, they, they carry 5G technology too. They're ready wow. to broadcast. So um, we'll talk about masks a little more, but the idea is that I think it will, it will be, it, it's already here, it's already happening. It will change the human body in both ways, positive and negatives. And I think they're experimenting not on America, they want to see what will happen. But I think it will happen in, some people will get way better and some people will, will get hurt. That's what usually happens. But I think the humanity is, is trans so that's one of the major transformations is through 5G, I think. Okay. Other waves also, but I think we are so, we're like, our bodies are just, go through changes, a higher, higher dimensional also, just the waves, the, the harp energies, the, the Wi-Fi, I mean, there is a fi Wi-Fi analyzer on the phone and you can see, even if you turn off your own Wi-Fi, in this apartment building, there is like another five peaks of this huge Wi-Fi peaks, which I cannot shut down. I have to go to every a neighbor and say, how about we just, only for the night, let's turn it off. I have them, I bought them, it's called silver thread um, sheet and I put the wire, like regular wire and I put it in the ground. I cut it, like there is a, pipe in the ground so I connected the okay. electric yeah yeah ground. grounding yeah yeah and so I, I have that sheet and on top of it I put like a clean sheet but at least my bed is is uh, pretty well grounded so this grounding sort of catches the waves and uh, you're not you're, you're getting like way less of the radiation nice try meter meter so I, I'll go around my microwave radiates a lot sure and there is a lot of radiations around and you can see towers around so you know, if you live in um, in the city, I mean, you're you're exposed to lots of radiation. Yeah, those are like stupid waves, but millimeter waves, they are, I, th I believe they are right into your DNA. So your DNA will transform in the next few years technologically. And I don't know in which way it will go, but it's like, you know, we are, we are living, we are like a big, huge experiment, which is run by, by mad people. Yeah, yeah. My answer about that. Big time. No, I agree. That's wild. So maybe it will help humanity to transform. Um, I mean, the new new babies, new children, they grow up already in this transformed um, electromagnetic environment. And um, I think they, they adapt much faster. Hum humans are pretty adaptable beings, creatures. We, are, we adapt. I mean, we adapt to, I adapt, adapted to, to Russia, and, uh, and now I adapted to, to American lifestyle. It's, it's, it's very different. We, we can transform, and there is still, still transformation going. Sure. Um, evolution also keeps going. There is that uh, idea of hybrids. So, yeah, let's talk about hybrids. Let's let's talk about hybrids because, you know, let's talk because you know. the aliens. Um, one of the benefits. I mean, they do it for some of them. Do it for selfish reasons. They just the greys, the zetas. They inject their DNA into humans, and the ones that have Zeta, Zeta DNA, they become uh, sort of controlled by the hive. They, they, uh, the Zetas can control them better, basically. And uh, in, they're known in the galaxy as the ones who do it secretly with other races. They kind of inject their DNA, and then once there is enough of their DNA in the society, they take over the planet and use its resources. On the Earth, I think it's, it will not happen because there is so much protection so many more aliens involved and Zetas I think they have been pushed away big way big time so I think that that danger is not here but but their DNA is here and uh, DNA of many others so that all together I think um, gives a lot of hope so we are being primed with the genes and some of these genes are very free fresh very recent and some of these uh, genes are ancient and I think they have been dormant here for a long time, but now they will awaken because I think um, the gods, the uh, keepers, the observers, the, the, uh, the um, gardeners, gardeners of the, of the planet, the uh, zookeepers, they, they change the parameters and see, I mean, you can see some days they change it too much and people just become either sick or crazy. And some days they just kind of adjusted to, and they feel great. 
And I think that they, they, they push us as much as they can and they, they, they control the, the things will end up well. I think we are in good hands. Good. I'm glad. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah, but, but the illusion, I think they keep the illusion of the drama. So, I mean, there are lots of villains around. And, um, yeah, we got to lose the drama. Everybody, man. Like, everybody listening to this, man. It starts when you're driving, okay? Don't mm. be selfish, right? Be cautious, okay? Don't be a jerk. You want to drive, you know, your portion and show off a little bit because you just, you know, messed up a bunch of people. Drive cautiously. Be nice to people outside, right? Why can't we all be nice to people? Hey, what's up, buddy? Hey, hello, you hello, hello. I know, hold the door for an old lady. Hold the door for a woman. Hold the door for some dude carrying a box. I don't know. If you could, right? And it helps. It's small things. Start, start small. Because we got a lot of problems to straighten up. But a lot of problems to straighten up. But it, we got to do it amongst ourselves, okay? You know another thing, Max, what I learned too since we last met? This earth that we're living in, it's, it's like you said, a zoo. Mm -hmm. So, and you're talking about hybrids right now. So let's, uh, I'll give you my two cents worth. All right. Um, Okay, so here I am. I'm Palladian stock. I know one guy is Zeta stock. Okay, I know another guy is Insectoid stock. Okay, I know uh, I know a, a good friend of mine out in uh, somewhere uh, in the states. There, he's um, what the heck is he? he was he was he was um, he's a tough dude, man. He's a tough dude, and he used to work for um, the American government, right? As an assassin, right, or a hitman, or whatever, but but for the government, right? And uh, he was a hybrid. He was a created hybrid in a in a military base. A reptilian so, movie. Yeah, his dad was the human, mm. and I don't know what the mother was, right? The mother, I don't know what I think it was like like reptilians, sort of or Zeta. I think it was actually in his case Zeta. Oh. And I've interviewed in the past, and Anunnaki. Well, actually, I'm lying. I probably interviewed two Anunnaki. And actually, one of them might be coming back next week. Um, so, and she's going to tell the story on that, right? From the time she was six years old. Well, from birth, actually. She was a moon child, right? So look up moon child, what it means in the metaphysical terms, right? And um, that's how it begins. But uh, so that's the part Anunnaki stock. Actually, I'm lying. There's probably three. I knew a Native American Indian uh, from Canada. Um, I, she was my sister for a long time. And I don't know what happened, man. But uh, we should hook up and say hi again soon. But um, not only was she a hybrid for that, for the Anunnaki, um, and being Native Indian, right, Native, um, Native Canadian Indian, she would... Um, shape shift mm. and she would shape shift into a, uh, an eagle right a big mm -hmm. eagle and i've seen her mattress when she would come back in to her body like in and then wake up again uh she'd have the talons on her feet right and she would rip up all the mattresses like where, where her feet are right so they they have to go through a mattress once every four to five months, <laughs> they're going to buy another mattress because she tore it up, right? So mm -hmm. that's a hybrid. That, and, and these are people, random people that I've met here, right? And throughout, uh, what else did I meet? Well, Cynthia Crawford is another one out in, um, I didn't meet her, but I heard of her. She's in Nevada, I think. She's Anunnaki human, right? Mm -hmm. Um, what else? Well, that's about it that I know at the top of my head, right? That are that are actually hybrid, right? Um, and these are physical, physical truths, like ph uh, physical evidence. Like, I mean, if you took a DNA sample, it would come up human and Anunnaki or human and unknown or whatever, right? Um, and it's just the way it is, right? It's It's not spiritually. Like, okay, I could take you back. Some of my guesses, I knew who I was before. Okay, so in 67, I was born as me, James Borg. 
But before that, okay, the, the lifetime before that, would you believe I was a Roman Catholic priest? Right? And I was a Roman Catholic priest in um, Ohio. Right? I probably died in the 50s. And it was Toledo, Ohio. Right? And then before that, well, I was a pretty good, good gunslinger. And um, I liked Missouri. Missouri was pretty dominant, right? And um, so I think I was either Jesse James or Bush Cassidy or, or, or whatever, right? It was one of them, right? Or even Sundance Kid. I think it actually might have been Sundance because he was a good gunslinger. He was probably the better of all of them, right? So actually, I'm, I think I was Sundance Kid. Um, and then before that, I was uh, I used to rob horses before. Well, and, and then I was a pirate, right? So I have memories of my past, right? And then that's like a spiritual thing, right? Because it's spirit, it's Sephiroth coming in. It's the memory, it's the ether, right? But I've been stuck here for quite some time, all right? So I've been born dead, born dead, right? Now I get a new body all the time and go about it that way. But uh, other people were created. And then we have hybrids on other planets, right? The Zetas, I think they keep all the babies uh, on their planet or spaceships or whatever they have. When it's Zeta human, is that correct? Mm -hmm. Right? Yep. Yeah, what I know about biology of Zetas, they, uh, they eat, uh, <clears throat> they, they don't eat through mouth, they eat by bathing in uh, nutrients. Through the pores of their body, that's right, yeah. Yeah, they absorb it from... They also excrete that way. How do you like that one? Oh. Yeah, you didn't know about that one, huh? They no, I, I don't. And they smell bad, okay? Uh, you can... They, that's If you're out in the woods and you hear a clicking noise, okay, but really loud, and then you hear another one, right? That's a form of Zeta language. One time... I seen a Zeta ship come in, a red ship. I'm looking at it, and I know if it's red, it's like, uh-oh, watch out, right? It's like one of those Zeta ships, right? So you got to, right? So I'm up north, and I see this, this red UFO come in, red light over the lake. And then before you knew it, I heard a clicking noise, not more than 10 seconds afterward in the forest, and they already landed. It's like they kind of froze me and landed and then unfroze, right? And then they're there on the ground, right? And um, but they're quick; they're very quick. But they smell; they have a smell. Certain, so not all the races of gray, but a couple of them do, right? And I've seen them also on fours when they walk on fours. And when they walk on fours, they look totally different, right? And they they run faster, right? Or they can whatever. But uh, it's unique, right? So it's. It's even a form of kind of shape shifting in a way, right? Mm -hmm. um, so okay, ramp, ramble on, carry on. Wait, wait, wait. All right, I, you, you raised so many topics. Um, I know I could be a handful of times, Max. Say, okay, you know that's just the way it is sometimes. One of the topics is uh, our ch children are out there. So many of us have children out there in the yes. stars, and many of them have children oh, in. Uh, yeah, right, it's like, you know, you touch our kids, look out, right? Anyway. Uh, they are in uh, in good hands. So there are many benevolent races who participate in um, hybridization programs, and they just hybridize humans and um, and their their own uh, their own people. So uh, I'm not sure about Pleiadians, but Yael certainly that did a lot of hybridization. And the yell uh, have uh, tall grays. They have different varieties. Some of the yell look very close to humans, and some of the yell are very, very different from humans, and all intermediate. And some of these um, children, they're waiting for us to actually awaken and invite them. So uh, these would be the first ones to, to come down, actually. Okay. And hopefully it will be done in our lifetime. So I hope so, too, yeah, because we got to get the planet going nice, right? Yeah, so, so they possibly wouldn't be, you know, ac actually changing things, but as a consult, as consultants and guests and cultural exchange, some of us might go out, and some of our, some of the aliens would come in. So, 
Uh, normally, by, by galactic rules, as, as with, with countries, um, relatives come first. Like America accepts relatives, so our children would be most likely the, the ones who will come first to, to visit. And, um, and I'm seeing that, well, I mean, not seeing, I'm imagining how good, um, good scenario might look like. Uh, obviously, some people would be very upset about that. So, so the aliens would, which would come here and which uh, would be clearly aliens, they might not feel safe in our cities. So, so I'm thinking that maybe they would better be guests in our yeah. um, closed yeah, communities. Yeah. And you need security for them, for sure. And right? Security, uh, yeah, right now hospitals are pretty safe and universities are sort of, usually there are university towns which are pretty safe. And some companies are pretty big. So some of the corporations might get some, some aliens and some of them do secretly, but, but the, now that could be public, public visitors. So right. I, I could imagine that uh, the aliens would enjoy being, living in the university campuses and being guarded there and being actually welcome there. And I can imagine them doing some cultural exchange. They teach us about their arts and um, we- For sure. We uh, exchange with them. Arts. Yeah, yeah. I heard, I don't know if this is correct. I think I heard it from Audrey. I, uh, he said our arts uh, are really, um, like, like earth arts, mm -hmm. is they never heard it. They never seen it in the, in the Pleiades, right? So can you imagine if you had like the Beatles, right? Mm -hmm. uh, oh, Beatles are amazing. 1966 to 1970, all the, all the Beatles songs. And you mm -hmm. took them with you to the Pleiades. And the very first music you introduce them to is the Beatles from like Rubber Soul onward, right? The, mm -hmm. the Rubber Soul album onward, right? You gave them all that. And that's the first music they're listening to is the Beatles. No, I'm, I'm sure they have it. Uh, I, I heard that uh, errands uh, follow our fashions and make them uh, extreme. Like when we got our first s s smartphones, they 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 had, Although they had all the technologies, but there was just a fashion item, but they made them huge. Wow. Okay. So, so they, no, they're following us. And um, so whatever we create is uh, some of that they pick up and some of them, you know, it's too harsh for them. It's too harsh. So, well, you know, uh, you're right. Some of the music, right? So stuff like, yeah, you can pick your music carefully, right? Like mm -hmm. some of the Robert Plant stuff, for sure they would love. Some Pink Floyd, a lot of Floyd they would love. I know that for a fact, right? Um, yeah, okay, so death metal, definitely a no-no. Like, don't bring them down, none, none of that, right? Uh, a lot of rap, same thing, right? But uh, Beatles and Floyd, you can't go wrong, right? For right. sure, those two, right? Yeah, Bashar says that their music is very simplistic. Uh, he says, you know, we play only a few notes or instruments, have fewer strings or few make fewer sounds, but there is depth in in, in the sound. So it right. doesn't have to be more more notes. It doesn't have to be more sophisticated. It could be simple, but now it's when it's multidimensional. I know they they have multidimensional music. Yeah, I and, have a memory. I was actually a music teacher, hmm. teaching uh, different alien kids music with strange uh, strange instruments. And here's the funny thing. All those instruments they had that were really weird, but made like incredible sounds. Even I didn't know how to play, but I was their teacher. Mm -hmm. and, the, and the funny thing was uh, one time I remember a kid saying to me, well, you can hear play this, right? You play this instrument. And I looked at him and I said, no, I got to go. School's over and all that. I made an excuse. And he goes, no, come on, teacher, play it, right? I looked at him. I go, you want to know the truth? And he, the kid goes, what? I go, you're way better than me. And I haven't played the instrument ever, right? And the kid goes, no way. And you're my teacher? And I go, yeah. And he goes, wow. And, but he go, it's done through emotion, right? The emotion. So I, I don't know how to play bagpipes, but I know what they sound when they are played good, right? Mm -hmm. All you got to know is that, right? And away you go. But anyway, you gave me a good flashback there, Max. Uh, nice. No uh, I, I heard uh, that um, in Pleiades they um, they have parties and in parties they um, make uh, uh, things dance in the air. They have like telekinetic abilities and p 
people fly and things fly around so they can uh, there is a like a sculpture which moves around and you kind of use your energy to to create nice. a sculpture okay cool <clears throat> is that oh. true audrey we're talking about dancing in the Pleiades. You're muted. Yes, this is true. This is true. Okay. Can you tell more? Ask him a question. Well, we have telekinetic abilities. Um, actually, see it. You've seen some of mine. Nice. Uh, How good is it now? How do you feel? Does it ground you? I mean, in Earth, I think it would be hard. Gravity here is a lot stronger on me than it is where I come from. Mm -hmm. It's a lot easier for us to, let's say, levitate where I come from. It's mm -hmm. a matter of uh, focus and meditation. And a lot of us that have mastered it, um, a form of meditation that doesn't require us to be in a full meditative state, we can be in a meditative state without having to sit. As we walk and interact with the world, we're still in a meditative state. So we can use that to our advantage to use telekinetic abilities and levitation. How, how old were you when you left? Again, I don't know my exact age. I couldn't tell you that specifically. We don't exactly keep track of time. I mean, how does it feel? Like you went away when you were a child or teenager or adult? I guess you could say adolescent to adult in mm -hmm. a way, at least in our years. Uh, so you already experienced some uh, sexual interest there? Um, not something that we want to talk about here. Oh, sure. I just wonder how the family life is, is designed out there. Well, in general. the thing is... Um, we don't have societies that work the same way that the society here works. People here would look down on other societies due to massive differences in the way we do things. You know, um, trying to explain relationships and things to people here I found is very difficult because they don't understand our ways we, you know, I've learned to understand theirs here. I understand the laws and the rules and the way things work here, but things are different where I come from. You know, we don't have the same laws and regulations on things. So, you know, age is, we don't, we don't measure by numbers. We measure it by your soul. We measure it by how long you've been here, how many times that you have recycled here. And our cycles are much longer don't live for just 80 years we live for thousands where i come from um yeah say say the children do they live with the families do they live with parents um that depends we don't have a veil when you come back you still have your knowledge with you it, you still remember who you were before you recycled so you come back with your knowledge where I come from. You don't lose your knowledge when you die. Nice. If your vessel finally expires, you know, and you want a new one, you don't lose your, <laughs> you don't lose your knowledge. So, um, as I was saying, uh, we, I guess you could say can be considered children when you're young, but we don't consider ourselves a new child, a new being. The moment we recycle, we still consider ourselves ourselves when we recycle. We don't change. We come back. Now we also ascend and descend. We go to the next plane and we come back when we choose. Do you look the same when you come back, Audrey? Yes, you do. Oh, okay. In most circumstances, your soul has its own, um, it's like its own DNA, memory. isn't it? Yeah, yeah, okay. It's a DNA memory. It will only return to a vessel that matches its DNA resonance. Right, okay. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, well, that's how they made So what does the drum? Would, so you wouldn't come back as a cat or a dog after having been a human. It'd be very difficult to do that. <laughs> In fact, almost almost impossible, but not entirely. 
technologically speaking, I guess you could force a soul into a animal body. Yeah. Or if someone really resonated with that animal, let's say throughout life and tribal traditions, for instance, you know, there are some people, their spirit animals here, you know, they resonate with that, with their soul very strongly, you know, maybe in the next life, they could possibly become a wolf or they could become a bear if they really worked on that throughout their entire life. You just named my two potent. But as far as we're concerned, where I come from, our, our souls are the same. So when, when we, when we recycle, we come back and we have the same look again that we had before. It's just a outer appearance, really just a reflection of your soul. Wow. Okay. So you're not going to look different. You will look more the same when you come back. You'll be renewed, of course. Now, if you ascend with your body, which is what we encourage, ascension is not about leaving your body behind and going with just your soul. No, because you end up in a transitionary period where you have to sit and wait for another body to, to be available. Then you come back. You, you have this loop, but when you ascend, you go with your body. Your body is your vehicle. That's your vessel. That is how you get to the next plane and back. You, wow. It takes your soul to the next plane. Does that make sense? The next dimension, mm -hmm. or let's say 4D or 5D, mm -hmm. depending on how high you've mastered. So if that makes sense to you... Um, then uh, it should make sense that we don't really measure based on age. Age is inconsequential where I come from. We don't measure things on time because we have plenty of time. Time is eternal. When you have an internal fountain of youth also to keep yourself youthful at all times, when you're meditating on a star growing at your center within your heart chakra, you're renewing your cells at all times. You slow the tests of time, the man-made concept of time on your body. Age is just damage like anything else, like a cut or a bruise. You know, it is just damage that can be healed. Everything heals. So even age itself can heal and turn backwards. Which is wow. Eh? Which is why, I'm sorry, um, That's right. which is why when we... Uh, when when I came here, I looked so young, at least to the people here, I looked like a child, the likeness of a child. I stood about five foot one. You know, I, I wasn't as tall as I am now. I'm a little taller now. But uh, I looked like a child to them, but my blood proteins spoke otherwise. So they were confused. They didn't understand why my blood protein said I was so much older than I looked on the outside. Wow. Let me ask about ascension. So what, what do you think um, is the time frame when the humanity is starting to ascend, when it's finishing to ascend, and how many of us will be able to do it? When the people are ready. Now, ascension isn't just going to happen with all of the population here all at once it doesn't work like that the people have to be ready for it there are many people in this society right now most of the population that are not ready to ascend they're not mentally and spiritually tuned to it yet they're not so you think it's a few hundred years i think that would be a lot different for everybody right um to be honest my personal opinion on that but I don't know if I'm right. But I'm just going to say it anyway. Okay, so if you're a bad person, like, constantly, all the time, and you're, like, a really shitty person, and you do a lot of shitty things, excuse my language, I don't think you'll be ascending for quite some time. And it's called a weight. It's called an anchor, right? We call it, like, an anchor. It's something, like, you know, you want to drop and cut the line, right? Um, so you can fly your Led Zeppelin in the sky. Um, so... A lot of people, you get, it's, it's Earth, it's Earth's inhabitants don't ascend all at once. The air lifted out, yes, right? But uh, it's, if you got enough, um, uh, big, big enough UFO, 
uh, but um, you can't extend all at once. I don't think it's a mass on mass ascension. It's based on what you can do. And it's not just on, on being good. Then you got to master the art of levitating and, and, and high vibration, right? So high vibration is the star going at your heart center that can get you there, right? So if you don't practice, then you, if you don't practice, you need more practice. So we should start practicing more, right? Well, I always say that you can't sail a boat with your anchors down. You can't fly a hot air balloon with your weights attached. In order for you to ascend, you have to learn how to let go of negativity, let go of all of the things that are bad in your world, the things that hold you down, the things you feel guilty over, the people you haven't forgiven. You have to learn to let things go before you can fly, before you can ascend. You have to be at peace with yourself on the inside. You have to learn to meditate and find your center, learn how to heal yourself. So. You have to learn how to find peace in a world full of chaos. And I know that this world is a big challenge for many people. This is a giant slave system. You know, it's incredibly challenging, but there are people in this world right now listening to my words that are learning how to ascend, that are learning how to find peace in all of this chaos. If they can do it, so can everyone else. So yeah. people have no excuse to not let things go they need to let things go let go of all of their quarrels and their wars and their battles here they have to learn how to live in peace and harmony with everything around them if they want to ascend there is only one way to do so and you, you can't as they say have your cake and eat it too you can't be evil and ascend you can't have a heavy heart full of anger and pain and misery and still ascend. It doesn't work like that. You have to learn how to let things go. Is so it? Go ahead. Is it worth ascending? It's always worth ascending. What, what is out there? I mean, what is here is clear. I mean, there is sex and beauty and uh, food and challenge and drama. And uh, what we are trading, we are trading that for what? You're trading that for absolute peace and knowledge, connection, oneness, and love. You connect, you're reaching a new state of enlightenment. Your spirit builds on itself every time you bring back new knowledge and you ascend to the next plane. 4D is so full of love wow. and compassion. Um, there is no war. There's no anger. It's a place for your, your soul to take a vacation. Um, where from is your knowledge? My knowledge comes from the universe itself. Do you have a personal experience of that, of that world? I have a personal experience of 4D, yes, and 5D. Can you describe a little bit? Imagine a place full of colors that you've never seen before, so bright and vibrant. Imagine a place full of light that just passes through your soul and makes you feel love. Every ounce of, of light that flows through you in that place is full of love and compassion. You feel accepted by the universe. You feel that connection. It is the most powerful connection you could ever feel. You feel like you are not alone. And you know everything when you're there. You can't take that knowledge with you, not all of it, down to this place. But you can take some. Is that called bliss? Enough to, enough to teach people. It's, a to, it's total bliss. It is love, bliss, and harmony. Wow. Everything is peaceful. That but, world up there is full of structures that were built out of love that do not hurt the environment. We have planets there that are just so bright and vibrant. It's almost impossible to describe in the English language. There wow. are no words truly to describe what you see there when you go there. So when um, humans ascend, uh, which, planet, which planet do they go to? Do they have like a choice? Is it like a distribution place where they, you apply to visit some planet or how they go? Yeah, I think, I think again, it's, it's um, the way you, uh, you said, the people, right? So the people's many, right? 
So, like I said, it's it's every every person's place is going to be different, right? I don't know. It might it's not like be the same planet, right? Again, my experience is Soviet Union. You live behind the curtain, and you can only imagine what's outside. Yeah, it's yeah. like a radio talking to you. I mean, you can possibly trust the radio, but you also know from experience that every radio has so many. I, I know, I know, and, and you, you got me going when we first started the interview uh, today. You were mentioning about species, right? Right. And then you were naming like the octopus, the dolphin, right, the whale, and uh, all these things. Cockroach, yeah. Cockroach, yeah. So of the three, I I said those are plagiarian uh, creatures, right? The uh, dolphins are from uh, Sirius, is aren't they? He took a little break for a sec. No, I think the dolphins are a Palladian, right? And whales too, right? I'm pretty sure of it. Because they come no, from no, dolphins. dolphins and whales are from Sirius. I mean they Arca. Pleiadian Arca. Pleiadian and Syrian cultures are connected, but I think it's from Sirius. Anyway. No, okay. No, Maybe, Orca. Okay. The, the, the planet Orca, right? That's where they need Somewhere to out there in the beautiful world, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but but it's actually a water world and they have dolphins are the primary uh, species on that planet. They have right. the most, right? And they have a language, right? The, uh, did you know the uh, autistic kids can speak the best dolphin? And I oh. discovered it in a public pool, right? Because I used to spend a lot of time in Florida. I used to fish. I used to go to the beach. So I seen a lot of dolphins in Florida. And I like dolphins. They're cool, right? Yeah. And I know how they kind of communicate. So a couple times, you know, we, we go to a community pool and there's autistic children swimming and um i heard them so like i heard one kid he was making this noise i kept on looking back because it was a very audible noise it was really loud and it was really different but it sounded like the dolphin so i looked and then he did it again and he knew i was paying attention it's like telepathic here happening mm -hmm. and uh, anyway i walked up um i swam up to the instructor who was with him i go you know, that boy's really talented. And, he, and she goes, why? I said, because he's speaking dolphin. Right? And she goes, dolphin? I go, yeah. Right? That's the language of the dolphins. Because I've heard dolphins and they sound like that. And it was, uh, and then he's doing the sound again. Right? And um, that's amazing. Like, you're going to see creatures out there. If you want, you know, them coming and everything else. There are all kinds of creatures. Like, don't forget the yeah, animals, the insects, right? They all come from different planets. And right? once in a while, I see dolphins here in San Diego. We have some nice communication with them. Wait, wait, oh, yeah? The dolphin? Nice. No, I bet you would. Yeah, you're in the Pacific Ocean there, right? So mm -hmm. that's cool. They're very smart animals. And um, octopuses come from the Palladians, right? Mm. That's another one, um, which is cool. Right, you picture octopus. Octopus. There's myths in in uh, Earth history where they're taking down galleons, right? The wooden ships, the big ones, right? From the 14th to well, 18th century or 19th century. That was a big octopus to do something like that, right? But they have. It's been written in journals and stuff like that, right? It's a myth uh, with some fact to it, right? It could be just a prehistoric uh, form of uh, an octopus from the from the time of the dinosaur, right? And uh, which which I think is the same with Loch Ness monster, right? It's just uh, an animal that didn't go extinct. We got a couple around, right? They survived, <clears throat> right? In other words, now with the Bigfoot. Now you're talking hybrid. There's an animal. That I believe is your, your one of your first hybrids, because after the Anunnaki left, they created the Sasquatch, I believe, right? And um, and then they were afraid of them, right? And they just let them loose. I think Sasquatch is, is a native. I, I don't think it's good. Was created. Created on Earth, though. Right? I think I think it's a native to Earth. Yeah, it is. Yeah, I believe Anunnaki is like, um, from Earth too. I believe it's created on Earth, the Anunnaki. Because the Anunnaki was started by a hybridization, right? And then he got the race. 
hybrids, eh? I, I heard that Anunnaki are um, humans, human looking, and they, they were big, obviously, in, um, in the area of Syria and um, Middle East, Babylonia. They're also tough, right? They're tough. Yeah. And um, they had some technologies, right? But I assume they came from outside. So, no, I, I might have lived here for a long time. Yeah, I, I believe they are they were created on Earth, right? Mm. If you go back, and I, I believe that's just my belief. I, I, I could be wrong. Who knows, right? But um, that's my belief. And um, but anyway, it's my opinion. Yeah, one project we started was uh, again with Gerg Fickner. Um We started volunteer volunteering for hybridization, basically donating your DNA to hybrids. I I think it's a good idea to to send our DNA out and have the hybrids in on other planets, on other ships. And uh, until now it was, uh, until recently it was uh, without asking people, but now there is an opportunity to volunteer basically. You can send a mail, you can uh, just talk to the aliens and offer them your DNA. And for some people it's, it, it changes the meaning of their life. Because if, if you don't have kids here and you have kids there, it's like, it's a huge difference. The only thing is that it's uh, it's your kids for sure, but it's also usually you and um, at least a couple more aliens. So they 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 adopt the the kid. So usually there are the parents, uh, the alien parents. They have their own child, but they take some of your DNA and make a hybrid of three people or sometimes four people. So your proportion of DNA in a child could be not half as usual. Like usually, you contribute half, your mate contributes half, but but right. in this case, it would be like a quarter. So you become more like a grandfather of a, you get a grandchild there. But, but it's nice. It's it's beautiful to have someone living oh, out. Sure. Yeah, I definitely agree. You know, and, it's like Star Trek. You know, Captain Kirk. You know, he goes uh, goes to this planet, and you know, he talks to this person. And he goes uh -huh. and he talks to that person, and and in in the in the course of doing that, right, he's eating, he's drinking, he's fucking. Right? Excuse my. And see, sitting sitting human DNA, yeah, everywhere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. But it's, um. Uh, I mean, the outcomes from, I mean, the new civilizations are created. And uh, the Earth experiment is very unique in a way that we have so much drama. Yes. And condensed whatever people do in thousands of years, we do it in like short human life. Yeah, like five. So the drama is pretty yeah. concentrated. And somehow our people are um, multiply well and are full of life energy. So Earth is unique in a way. I mean, on other planets, it's much shallower as I hear. And here it's, 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 it's more dramatic and lot, lots of energy. So shallow, you're talking shallower. Now, I'm gonna ask you, because you're from California there. So you ever been to Mount Shasta? No, not yet. Not yet. I, I want to. Yeah, that's, that's definitely, I'd be top of my list. Right, one at the top, right? Mm -hmm. It's like, 12 hours driving from here. It's a little too much. Oh, yeah? Mm -hmm. Okay. I've been to Sedona. We did a workshop there. So our community, Hukola, we do workshops. Uh, the next workshop is in August in Rochester, New York. Oh, you're going to go back up to Rochester, yeah? I, I will go teach... Um, uh, what am I teaching? Oh, I teach, uh, I teach um, hybrid history, basically, of the hu human race. Uh, you know, who went where, where and um, who hybridized who. Yeah. Wow. Okay. So now, now like the Jewish books, yep. is that, isn't that a lot of Anunnaki in there? They're not called that way. I but know. But if you're trying to cross reference what we call them and what they called them back in the in days of old, right? I'm not sure. That part is very unclear. But um, I just recently came across the idea that Jews are. Uh, before they went to Egypt, they not all the Jews went to Egypt. Some of the Jews went to Egypt, were they enslaved and then escaped and founded Israel. But I believe there were lots of other Jews which weren't in Egypt. They scattered. Uh, they scattered the tribes. Yeah, uh, scattered. But then, then they sort of. It's more like uh, Jews are very interesting. It's, it's infectious um, lifestyle. So some people people were recruited to be Jews. They. they so Jews are very, very, very wide mix of, of uh, genes. Okay. And uh, I believe there was a lot of uh, alien seeding among Jews, especially Ashkenazi, I think, were, were seeded by, I think, Yael. Oh, okay. 
and that was 600 years ago. So there was like big infusion of alien genes in in, in uh, modern like 600 years. Right, really, the Renaissance the Jews. in the Renaissance. Yeah, and but I think to Egypt, they went from India. I think Jews are uh, ancient Indians, just just a branch of Indians who went uh, traveling. Um, yeah, because I think southern the, Indians. The reason why I asked that is Moses. Mm -hmm. We have pictures of him with horns, right? Mm -hmm. And so I'm wondering about that. Like, would that be Anunnaki or what race do you think that might be? I think it's Anunnaki, but I could be wrong, right? I don't know, right? Because they also mentioned the Elohim, right? And uh, right. so I, I, that might be, a you know, a type of um, from up there, right? So oh, I think at that time... Um, it's really hard to put the time on that. It could be whatever they say now, or it could be much, much earlier. I think the time scale is so messed up. I mean, altogether, uh, it's called Mandela effect. I think we are mi mixing multiple timelines into one, and some timelines are more like traditional, like 5,000 years, and some timelines are more like 50,000 years, and some maybe okay. a million years. I think there is a mix. Um, but in those and times, you're right, by the way, yeah, in those times, I think there was a lot of alien presence. So we are channeling like uh, Egyptian pharaohs and uh, and some people from that time. Uh, and um, yeah, there was the alien presence was normal. There was like ships coming up and down, there were alien technologies, there was big stratification, like different caste systems, and on the top, there were aliens. Uh, Egyptian rulers were like these bird people. They were like blue, blue avians. And, That's right. And, uh, you know, the whole life was... So did the Mayans. Some of the Mayan high chiefs or the shamans. I, look, I was a yeah. shaman a couple times mm -hmm. over there. So we had... Um, my headdress was like kind of like really big. And it was mm -hmm. blue, right? Mm -hmm. And um, it's like you're high all the time because you're a shaman, right? So... Mm -hmm. But that was what I did, right? And I used to do uh, I runs, trails, right? But the trails like went for miles, right? And some of them underground, right? Oh, wow. And I knew all the paths, right? But when you go underground, you always take a couple other Indians with you, right? They're like your um, bodyguards, right? Okay. Yeah, right. Because some of the other Mayans, Mayans were like like really vicious for a while, right? Mm -hmm. They had a club, right? The Mayans, they they always used a club. It was like a um, shillelagh, but more, more better, more heavier. You could throw it, right? Not only can you whack somebody on the head, you could throw it, and it will spin, boom, right? Usually, they'll kill on the first throw, which which is deadly, right? So you don't want to get hit in the head with that one, right? Mm -hmm. Because you won't be like walking around no more. But um, that's the Maya, right? The Maya bird. The bird, Egyptian, Egyptian mm -hmm. bird god, right? That's the connection mm -hmm. I'm trying to make, right? And also flying, right? Like mm -hmm. you're flying, right? A lot of shamans like feathers because it's like you're flying. You're flying high, right? You're flying, you're flying with this, uh, with the ether and everything else, right? So basically after destruction of the destructions of Atlantis, there were several layers of destruction. The humanity went down and lost a lot of technologies and a lot of power, and it was all in disarray. Yeah. So, yeah. And then the aliens came, and especially blue aliens, and they just restored restore the economy. They gave some technologies, they gave agriculture, taught people to write, taught people like the certain rules. And for a while, we were um, herded as uh, stupid humans, and the aliens gave us the direction what to do. But there was uh, layers of aliens and humans, and uh, it sort of functioned once in a while. But also they fought battles. So, you know, the, the even bluebird pharaohs, they went and conquered other lands and um, collected resources and the things of that sort. So it was, for them, it was also a playground. In addition to growing humanity, that was a playground for, for fighting. Um, so in that environment, the, the, Jew, the Jews, I think... Uh, there is some Zeta Gray uh, behavior in Jews. They kind of come to the country, we come to the country and uh, take it over and then you explore it, exploit it, I guess. Yeah. So, so that, that is, uh, you know, part, part of, I guess, the Zeta strategy. 
Okay. But also, it's 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 the intellectualism. It is uh, the ability to 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 build things and uh, fix things and transform things. Right. But but it's um, aliens within uh, you know different layers. I'm just now listening on a book on um, genetics of the human populations, like modern science. How we it like in the last few years, it was like really transformative understanding who comes from there. The whole history changes because. Okay. You no, know, it's possible to trace who comes from where, and uh, the whole pattern is, is is changing now because it's the genetic analysis is much more powerful. Right. What uh, what what they discovered? One of the things was amazing was that in India, uh, we would think that it's a uh, one people unified genetically mixed, but they discovered that it's a lot of strata, a lot of um, small um, caste caste small caste small tribes. Living together but never mixing for thousands of years. So, so it's not one country. It's like a layer on layer on layer of multiple uh, ethnic groups living together but never mixing, and it was kept for thousands of years. Wow. So, so um, India look, seems to be the birthplace of many things, and um, it's very ancient birthplace. Maybe it's like many, many, many thousands, much more. Many, Many more than we're thinking now. We're like thinking of human history for about maybe ten thousands of years. Right. But really, uh, human history goes back into Atlantis, and humans and Atlanteans co- coexisted for a long time. Right. Atlanteans, with, I mean, a common misconception is that Atlanteans are humans, and they're not. The first root race was Hyperboreans, then were Lemurians. And then were Atlanteans, and it was different races. So Atlantis basically died out. There are maybe a few Atlanteans left here, lots of Atlanteans who went elsewhere and started the colonies on other planets. And the humans were sort of undeveloped race, like more like um, primitive people living on the outskirts of big um, uh, states. But But later we inherited that planet, and we... Uh, were educated and uh, herded to 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 build our own systems and own uh, hierarchical structure like you know states Chinese Indian um, American and um, Egyptian and so on. Right. And then gradually they stepped out. I don't know why they left the aliens, but somehow they left and and maybe many of them went underground. And I, I heard in Vatican there is still some, some Atlanteans and some uh, some other aliens, sort of controlling things. Maybe negative, but you know, the, um, Orion, Orion's, uh, uh, and, and some yeah, they got something there. That they got that get a doorway to something. That's for sure. Right. Right. Yeah, there are stargates, so so they come and go. And plus, uh, plus the Vatican sits on a mountain, eh? So they can go deep, right? They got a lot of um, they got a lot of uh, subterranean stuff at the Vatican. I, I don't know. I I visited Vatican when I had a chance. You know, we cannot see anything from the surface. I mean, they're just like buildings, right? Right. But, well, but uh, they have they have stuff that goes underground, subterranean wow. stuff. But they you don't know about because they don't tell you, right? But uh, but they have because that's where they keep all the um, stuff that didn't get destroyed. Right, all the all the um, all the stuff that survived the witch burnings and uh, all right, right. The native uh, native burnings and stuff like that that did in South America, right? Yeah, Na- Napoleon uh, at some uh, at some point there was Egyptian ca- campaign of, of Napoleon. Very interesting, you know. They went and conquered lots of artifacts. Yes, and them, they left the army there. They lost the battles to yeah. England, and also but, the uh, the Iraq. Remember yeah. after nine yeah. eleven. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. U.S. went to war with Iraq, right? Mm-hmm. Okay, well, you know, Iraq was Babylon, okay? Mm-hmm. That's Babylon from the from the Torah and the Bible and, and all the books, okay? That's the same city. Mm-hmm. So there's a lot of, um, and also I, an Iraqi told me this too. He goes, to dig a tree or put a hole in the ground, you got to get a permit from the Iraqi government. And the reason why is you might find artifacts. They're really big on artifacts. So, and it's not uncommon to unearth something because there's a lot of artifacts. And he goes, you don't have to try very hard. You'll come up with a statue or something else or a cup or whatever. And um, 
the army went in because not only are there a lot of artifacts in Iraq, there's a lot of artifacts with a lot of occult symbolism and meanings, mm -hmm. and magical um, relationships to what it did, uh, that a lot of the items were wanted. Like, so they went in on the first you know, few days of the war and they ransacked all the occult artifacts from the museum. Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. It was documented. Right? And then they say, well, they will give them back or whatever. But I think they took, they chose what they wanted for specific reasons mm -hmm. due to the occult history of the past and kept them for whatever reason they're keeping them, right? And um, that was a major grab, right? That yeah, same, same Smithsonian Institution in the United States. That's their function to collect stuff. Yeah. Well, that's true, right? And you, you collect stuff and you're not, sometimes you're not no. The public doesn't know what they're actually collecting or what they're making a discovery of. And that bugs me about Egypt too, especially right now, right? There's a lot of things happening in Egypt as far as archaeology goes mm -hmm. that'll blow everybody away, but you're not being told about it, right? And it's been happening ever since the turn of this century, right? Pretty much, right? Uh, switching the topic, I mean, they all linked, but um, Elon Musk is fascinating. I mean, I think he is an alien, obviously. Um, Elon, yeah, he looks like one in the way. In the way. I mean, his mind is amazing. He, his yeah, mind yeah, is amazing. Sure. I like Elon Musk, by the way. Yeah, I, li I like his, uh, I'm charmed by him. Yeah. Uh, now, why he is allowed to, to do what he does? That's a huge question because other people are not permitted to do any, anything close to, I mean, he goes to the space, you know. Well, no, he worked for it. He was uh, a smart kid right from the get-go, right? In, in the university, him and his brother, and they only went there for like four days at university, right? And they said, okay, I'm out, I'm out right? And they, they left. No, I, I know his story, but I think his story is incomplete. I think there was a deal. I think there was a deal with the military because otherwise, I mean, like it, Martin, Martin uh, another military huge well there would have to be yes because he is flying in the space and he is in american soil and he is using american tools and technology i mean he's competing with them they had like contracts for billions of dollars and now he, and he they gave the him the right to compete i think they they there should be some some agreement i mean um Not but sure uh, there is right I'm, I'm thinking he he somehow fits into the system i think they allowed him what what is permitted Elo, yeah for sure he'd be great i mean it's like He's You're a smart kid, party. you do whatever we need. But I think uh, his, uh, one of his obsessions is to put a colony on Mars, right? And I'm thinking on practical reasons, it makes no sense because they already have colonies. The secret military have already colonies on Mars. They have portals to Mars. They, they travel there. I know, but, I know. But, but now they're but, admitting to it, right? All right, but Musk is doing it. Now finally say, okay, it's there, right? But Musk is doing that officially, like publicly. And I think when Earth, I mean, my wild guess, an educated guess is that when the Earth has a publicly acknowledged colony on Mars, when Earth has a colony on another planet, we graduate in a galactic code, the laws, we are become multi-planetary multi -planetary civilization, which Musk pronounces. And once we are multi-planetary, then we allow to join the galactic society. I think that's that's the trick. Okay, so we already joined them. No, when we have a secret, because yeah, when we have secret things, it's maybe it doesn't count. They didn't approve it, but when we have the official colony, I think that that's when we graduate, and okay, that's when yeah, they allow. Yeah, yeah, makes sense. Yeah, no, yeah, you're right. Maybe, yeah, for sure, I would agree. Yeah, right. But you know what? You, you got to. Um, I'd pick a good planet, right? And uh, make it benevolent right from the start. Unlike what happened here, right on Earth, right? We've had a lot of wars on Earth, right? It's unbelievable. Right. If you punch up in the, in the computer, if you can get a computer that good and see every war that happened on Earth, list, and you know, and shh, wow, right? That's, that's too much war. And then where Audrey comes, it's, it's like there's, they don't war. It's yeah, take, take Minecraft. Uh, Minecraft was created as a peaceful game 
you would just dig gold. I mean, somewhere Anunnaki put in our genes their love for digging gold, love for gold and love for digging. I, I experienced it myself. Digging for something is, is fun. And I, I know many other people just love digging. So Minecraft is a kid's game and you just dig, dig gold out and other uh, minerals. But soon after they created communities and what they did, they... Hey, here's a funny joke for you. How many pirates does it take to bury a pirate's chest on an island? I don't know. You know? Okay. Nine. And one was the captain. And what happened was every time they go, right, two people would get killed, right? Because the, the, the only one that knows on the way back is the captain rowing the rowboat to the, to, the, to the ship, right? So be careful when you're digging because... Most of the pirates that went with the captain, they didn't come back, right? They were, they were, that was it. Because only the captain knows where the buried treasure is, right? Or the treasure. I see. I see. That's, that's the lore, right? But anyway. Yeah. So, so Minecraft was a com community developed game. And initially it was peaceful. It was like a paradise where you just build stuff and dig stuff and like live in a, in a model of uh, natural, it was very natural. You dig stuff, build stuff, right? Okay. You, you, you farm chickens. I never played the game, by the way, so okay, yeah. but go on. Um, check it out on YouTube. I mean, YouTube is like, Minecraft videos you know, have like millions of views. Like our videos would have like thousands and Minecraft videos would have like lots of millions. millions anyway, so. soon after they created war, they would divide into clans and would fight each other and kill each other and they created paradise and underworld and underworld became way more popular than paradise so what it teaches us about human nature i'm stupid in a lot of ways <laughs> big time yeah. i mean people are given a paradise they, they're given a peaceful world where they can live forever no they limit this the time of their life and not the time. They limit. They 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 make themselves vulnerable, so they play uh, to kill and to survive. They play right. survival. It's called survival mode. So most of Minecrafters play in survival mode. They can become more immortal and play and live in the paradise world and just build beautiful stuff. And usually girls do that. But the boys live survival and fight each other. Some trade, some trade, and some fight. Sounds like the Greeks, man. It's like a, a days old thing. They used to fight everybody too, the Greeks. And uh, the, they used to fight a lot, right? Amongst um, themselves. Scott yeah, I, the same thing too. I teach energy healing. And the energy it's healing, better. especially in, 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 Russian, uh, in Russian branch of it, we, we talk about chakras, and each chakra is a level of development. So a root chakra is survival. Okay. And my, my, much of the humanity is still in a survival mode. Wow, they learn, yeah. learn the, the, the art of survival, just, you know, getting food, not getting killed, uh, you know, compete for resources, dig, do labor, physical labor, right? Uh, second chakra is trade. You become a salesperson. And, you know, start talking and socializing on a lower level. And most of the humanity is either playing survival or trading and like many people are salespeople, right? And then the third level is warrior. And the third level solar plexus is warrior. And the humanity is still in three lower chakras, enjoying the lessons of survival, trade and fight. And then later you go into heart, love, and you go into uh, art, and you go into their science, and you go into the spirituality. And uh, some of us come from top to bottom, but many come from bottom to top and right. still still play in the low three chakras. And wow. some of us still play play these games, like we still learn to survive and you know, become rich and uh, dominate others. Dominate is, again, warrior chakra. Wow. Uh, the transmission from the warrior to the priest is through service. You become a monk. Yeah, a shaman. Yeah. Yeah, a shaman, a monk. So so the warrior, lower level of warriors just fight and higher level is service. I mean, some people 
are in the army not because they will have to fight, but because they want to serve. Right. And that's like the one of the ways to serve. So, so that's a transmission. So you know, obviously, we are in a transition state, but um, uh, we choose our lessons. And some oh. people choose to. Where is your attention? Yeah, if your attention is on survival, if your attention is on um, conspiracy, then you are still in that predicament. You are being dominated by some people. You, some people take charge of you, but it's it's your attention. You create your reality. It's all the matrix, and this matrix is multifunctional. Some, you know, where is your attention? That you get the lessons in that. Say, if you're of the right state of mind, there could be the whole war around you, but you wouldn't even notice because you would focus your your attention on something else. It's it's what you notice what makes your life. Oh, for sure, definitely. Mm -hmm. And I like to focus on DNA. My, my focus on hybrids and DNA. And as I said, we we started a volunteer, volunteer program. You can uh, apply. Just, no, just it's, it's email to sign up to go at gmail.com and uh, say I want to volunteer. And usually they read, and and um, you one day you will notice that they take some of your sperm, and some of them are butchers. Like when they took my sperm, I, you know, I had a uh, pain for, for, for weeks after that. Wow. Yeah, I mean, they, I, I could gladly voluntarily give it, but no, they come, just put you to sleep and then, you know, use instruments to take it out. Jeez. <laughs> I like the more, but, more physical way. Yeah, yeah, but, uh, wow. Yeah, but, but so, yeah, and again, they, they just <laughs> steal fetus, fetuses. So they, they can take a fetus and, you know, hybridize and, uh, and then uh, it's like false pregnancy. And that happens too. But but then this fetus has become your hybrid children out there. And uh, and I'm looking forward to meet them. I think uh, sure. there is a chance of us meeting. Good. I had an experience. Eh? Um, so I was raped one time, right? But I was raped by, um, uh, it's like a shapeshifter, right? Uh -huh. And um, she entered the room, right, as a beautiful beautiful girl right beautiful woman right but it was a ghost right it was a ghost and i seen her right that's wow because i was already dreaming about her a, a day before all right because i was doing some uh metaphysical work on a house and uh what happened when i was there the ghost that was in that house hopped in my car so which the house that called me paid me anyway because they wanted to be, I mean, to remove the ghost, which I guess I did, <laughs> right? But the ghost came with, the problem was it came in the car with me, and I didn't know, right? I was like, okay, because I was still young at the occult, and uh, sometimes you make mistakes. And um, so I go home with this ghost that I don't even know is in the car. And I go to bed, right? I'm having this dream about her, right? I'm going, wow. Oh, she died that way. She was good looking. I was getting her life story. And then how she died and what she became afterward, right? And it's like, wow, right? I see it at all. You know, the death and the thing. And um, she came in as a ghost. But what she became was like a demon, right? Afterward. Mm -hmm. And what I got was the demon, right? Mm -hmm. but, right? So that's what happened at one time to me. But it was a female demon. It was succubus, right? So it was, you know, it had wings and it, it wow. banged the hell out of me, all right, for a long time, which which was was uh, exhausting actually, right? But it was uh, it was quite the experience, right? Big time. I guess you might want to call it like Jared, like Kirk Douglas said, the bang of a lifetime, right? But um, so did, did did do you like it or you didn't like it? I loved it. It was um, wild. It would, the bed was levitating even. It was um, a really good, you know what, right, for for quite some time. So I loved it. Yeah, I was exhausted. Though. How was your health after that? It was, um, mm, it was good. It was good. Good. Yeah. So be, um, I was slick. I was more powerful back then, right? We're stronger. So we started our um, 
community work in, in Rochester and I connected to local uh, healers and light workers. Uh, Reiki, Reiki circle is great. And Rochester is one of the great places for Reiki. Um, somehow Reiki is very popular there. And, and then I went to California. And, uh, actually, I went to Chicago. I connected to people in Chicago and met one of my uh, guru friends. And, uh, and I'm still connected to Jim and uh, Jim Charles and Rochester, New York, and uh, Lucia Dashkevich in Chicago. It's one of the enlightened beings there. Oh yeah. So Pleiadian, and um, cool. and here, um, and here I met a couple of people who are very bright, and uh, and uh, it's it, here it circles around yoga and Indian culture. It's pretty good here in San Diego. So nice. So <clears throat> I, I I do Russian community. Uh, we do heal, healing circles and uh, drum circles and fires on the beach so oh, i love that i love that i, I know audrey says you can't have fires up there but i'm gonna have really? fire. yeah, yeah yeah on the beach yeah you know they don't they they allowed the mayans the first time the mayans came that's why a bunch of mayans come, went missing but when they brought the mayans to their one of their planets mm -hmm. I'm, I'm being an ex-mayan myself right but uh oh really yeah oh, yeah a couple times over and uh and inca too but um, when they brought them over, they loved their fires, right? Mm -hmm. So they lit a fire and did like, you know, the dancing, right? The fires and dancing and, and making noise and chants, and noise, which is cool, right? You have fun. And um, the Palladians went a little kind of like mad because you're not supposed to light fires on the planet because it's pollution. Oh, so right. they're on their planet, not, on not their here. Planet, yeah, right. Oh. And the, and the planet is actually called Maya, right? Yeah. So Maya went to Maya, right? So, which is ironic, right? No, it's supposed to be that. So, yeah, I know I'm just saying, right? But, um, yeah. But I, I have a lot of good fires here, right? As long as it's responsible, right? Well, you, everybody likes a good campfire, right? So, why did the Mayans leave? The Mayans lived uh, south of Mexico to base. Why, why, why did they leave from here? Why they emigrated from Earth? No, they were airlifted out. Why, why did they do that? Because the conquistadors were about to annihilate them. Oh. And uh, the Plagiarians felt sorry for them. Mm. So they said, you know what? This is a worthy tribe. Okay. And they picked them up and zoomed them away. Same thing with Machu Picchu. Uh, probably at the same time, because Machu Picchu, that was the Incas and uh, the Inca king. Did you know Machu Picchu used to be employed by about like 800 women, right? And they were handpicked. And that's all they did. They lived in Machu Picchu. They were very smart and very good looking, right? All the women, right? And then there's about, there's like 800, I think it was either 400. It's either 400 or 800 women went missing of the Incas on Machu Picchu, if, the, if I'm not mistaken. And that's rumored to be on the player in the Palladian planets as well, right? Sometimes they've done things in the past that kind of helped, and we didn't even know, right? Yeah. Anyway, we must be at the top of the third hour by now. Audrey, you're around there. I'm around. Do you want to keep on talking, guys, or do you want to... Okay, you know what? I'm getting kind of tired because it's like 12.15 my time, right? So maybe we'll call it a night. It was a great uh, conversation. And before we, we call it a night, Max, take a few minutes to say, you know, talk to Andre or say whatever you want to say and close out this interview. And I'd love to have you back again and talking with Audrey as well. Thank you for having me. Yeah, I'm on my mission. I, I choose my mission. Andre, do you want to say something? Oh, I just wanted to thank you for joining us. Um, this was a wonderful conversation. I could listen to you for hours. Yeah, it was one of my really longest. Wonderful days. conversation. So you know how to find me, maxrempel at gmail.com. That's the easiest way to find me, maxrempel at gmail.com. Um, I'm looking for investors, and it's a serious business. I think we'll be able to take take over the, the medical market with our electromagnetic devices, which work through DNA resonance. Absolutely. Um, the technology is 
pretty pretty developed. We didn't get it to practical use yet, but uh, we've already made major breakthroughs, so we have unique knowledge. Um, I'm connected to le leading uh, scientists in that area, like Peter Garayev in Russia and um, uh, Dan Winter in France and Richard Allen Miller in uh, Oregon. Uh, so so we are we are making that revolution in, in, in science and we have good chances to make it. And uh, if we do it, it would be first the financial opportunity, but also it would be a transformational opportunity to change the, the health. Basically, people would awaken to their uh, vibrational nature. Indeed. And ecology would uh, will be able to measure ecology, will be able to measure the pollution. So it will become obvious now it's more like uh, hard, hard to prove. You need to do experiments, but with the measurement of uh, DNA vibration, it would be more obvious. And also more obvious will be the, the spiritual nature of, of humanity because once you get into DNA vibration, you understand um, how the soul is connected to the body. And finally, it um, will help to understand the language of the brain, of the mind. Because the, I believe the language of DNA and the language of the mind are the same language. So once once we crack the DNA language, once we understand the language of DNA, we'll be understand, able to understand the language of the mind. Um, so I, I hope to build a nice scientific community around that. There is a lot of believers, but finding is absolutely zero. People fund their research always by themselves. So a so, uh, little money will make a huge difference. And um, the company is called Salana Genomics, um, one of my companies uh, focused on that. The website is hucolo.org, uh, salanagenomics.com and hucolo.org, H-U-C-O-L-O.org. And you can find me on Facebook and Skype. My Skype is ms2040507. Okay, all right. Send me those links. Okay. Sure. We gotta, we, gotta, we gotta edit this video, so that might take a few days or weeks. I don't know, maybe even years. I <laughs> I don't know. I'm just joking. But um, so send me the links, and um, this way when the video is up and running, I can put it out there too on in the in the description part of the video. Yes, thanks. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, man, it was a great interview. It was probably the longest interview I've ever done with anybody. So, except for Tony I, I've done Tony Rodriguez. We went, we went quite a long time, but it was on like four different days. You have good energy. To, I, I was uh, feeding on your energy. Oh, I was laughing. That's you know, I was I was having a great time with you, buddy. Right? That was a great conversation. We we touched upon a lot of stuff. And, and Adri, thank you. Fun. Nice, to, nice to meet you. I I, lo I love uh, Pleiadians, and I love to meet aliens. And uh, absolutely, likewise. Thank you so much for joining us. It's it's nice reunion. Big time. Likewise. All right. So please stay on the line after uh, Max and Audrey. Uh, as for the rest of you, the rest of the whole wide world, have a great night. Wow. Felt like I was in a Buddhist monastery for a second. And all the rest of everybody else out there, good night from Euphoria Chronicles Shockwave Radio. Thank you. <laughs>